Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Thursday, uh, another EOS family session. Uh, my name is Nick. Uh, welcome to all of you from all over the world. Uh, it's still uh, morning in New York, so I'll be having my coffee. Uh, David's joining us from the West Coast, and I, I'm not even sure the sun is up over there. Uh, so. Very much morning on the West Coast. <laughs> so uh, thanks, all of you, for joining us again. Uh, uh, we are, are pleased to be able to bring you um, hopefully some really useful information while we have some extra downtime. Uh, so uh, this is a part of our study hall. Uh, study hall is, is what we've been putting together, um, including live webinars on various subjects, uh, putting together uh, videos of the day and AMAs on Instagram and things like that. So um, if you're interested in more information, uh, check out uh, EPC Connect. Uh, dot com slash study hall. Uh, that does require my ETC login, so uh, feel free to check out more stuff there. Um, and, and all these sessions do get recorded and we post them on the ETC study hall uh, page on YouTube. So feel free to hop on over there if you miss a session. Um, today, our friend uh, Hog folks will be putting on uh, Build That Fixture. Um, and then there's a special Hog event tomorrow. Uh, which is Welcome to the Third Party, which is Mark Lawrence discussing uh, integration with Hog. Um, so that will certainly be a good session if you're interested. Um, also, uh, Rob Crane, the illustrious Rob Crane, will be presenting uh, the third session in our augmented learning series. Uh, he's going to cover objects, uh, aiming, and XYZ palette. Uh, AIM, if you've been playing along in the beta, has just undergone a major renovation. Uh, so we think we're better. Uh, so you'll want to hop in and get a quick little tutorial from Rob on how that functions. Um, so for today, we have uh, Mr. David Kane, who is uh, <laughs> um, Thanks, Nick. My, my 9 a.m. Photoshop clipping added for us. Um, oh, and, uh, and so again, uh, Rob and I are here to help facilitate um, but obviously the star is the David Kane. Um, so uh, ask questions uh, in the Q&A as things come in. Um, we're going to try our best to keep things on topic uh, with what David's covering. Um, we will uh, uh, kind of try and wrap up the main bulk of stuff before 1, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern, so that if you want to hop over to Hog, you can. Um, but obviously if there are any lingering questions or anything that you want to talk about, um, David has very kindly offered to stick around for uh, a few extra minutes, um, and we'll answer uh, any questions we can. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. David Kane uh, for EOS Family Effects. Mr. Kane, you are in charge. Oh boy, everybody look out. Alrighty, let's see how I can do this. That worked. Yeah, cool. All right, cool. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Welcome. Um, so we're going to talk about a couple things today. Uh, as I was putting this together, I, you know, I decided it might be best to ta uh, tackle a couple things that are super powerful, but I think are often misunderstood. So we're going to talk about uh, some effects line order stuff to start the day, because that's going to carry us through the rest of it. Um, we're going to kind of dive deep into grouping and trail and how that relates. They relate to each other and how that interacts with offset. Uh, and then we're going to end the day with a couple newer features. Uh, break mode, which actually is in 2.9, um, but doesn't really, hasn't really been given due diligence anywhere yet. Uh, and then variables, which is new in 3.0 and still is undergoing some work. So I am doing this in the 3.0 beta. Um, so there will be a show file that comes out to this. And if you do want to play along, uh, you need to be on the beta for that. And the forums are the place to go get the beta. All right. So. I've got this little rig here, this little augmented rig that we made for this. Um, it is you know, purely something that we've made so we can view running some good effects here. Um, so before we get started, one thing we want to talk about is how effect line order uh, is going to change how we view an effect, right? So I, I started here, um, I don't have any effects, right? If I was to look at my effects list, I'm starting with a, basically a blank show file, uh, just like you guys would. So we're going to build it all as we go along. Um, and I think that's one thing that's really important to me is there's no, no secret sauce, right? Like a lot of us may start our show file, our shows with pre-built files, but 
you know, the, the effects we're coming in with and all the tools we're coming in with, they're just tools, right? Like I may have a hammer I've worked with for years, but it's still just a hammer. Um, so today we're going we're gonna to work on actually establishing some of those tools. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to uh, create an effect. And mostly what we're dealing with today is we're going to deal with uh, absolute effects. And we're actually just going to pretty much live in the world of two-step absolute effects. Uh, it's crazy what you can get done with just two steps and then working with your grouping and your trail and your offset. Um, and I want to talk about the difference between these two lines here, right? So right now our default EOS is zero over a background state. I'm going to go ahead and label this zero slash background, uh, not DK, BKGD. And then I'm going to create another effect. So I want you to be absolute. And I'm going to change this to be a background over zero. Right? And if we play these back, BKGD0, right? if we come back into live here and we play these back on, say, let's say fixtures 1 through 10, right? we'll bring it to full because it's going over a background state, right? as I toggle between these, it's actually going to look like not much is changing. right? It, I mean, you can see the effects kind of restart, but it looks like it's the exact same thing. But they're not. They're actually doing really different things. Um, it's important to understand how that works. So if we come back into our effect editor here, and I actually change the trail on both of these, so let's trail, change the trail on this to 25%, and we're going to change the trail on the second one to 25%. Now, we are playing back on effect two. If you remember, effect two is our background state over zero. And what we have right here is we are actually running that background state over that that background state or that intensity state coming from our manual data here over a state of zero. If I was to select those channels and I was to run the other way around, we are actually now running that zero step over the background state. So depending on whether or not we want to run, say, a bar of light or a bar of dark, the order of these steps here really matters. And that's one thing that I think uh, you know, we really need to grasp before we move on to dealing with some of these, um, these other steps. All right, so before we kind of get a little deeper, let's take a moment and let's talk about grouping and trail, okay? Because I think there are two things that are often misunderstood, um, but they're, they're worth taking a moment to talk about. Um, even if you think you understand them, hopefully there will be some benefit to this, right? So when we're talking about grouping, right, um, if we think of like an effect as like our road, right? Group it and then channels, the individual channels, in this case, channels one through 10, right? These channels are the passengers on the road. They're traveling down this effect. Grouping is how many cars uh, are going along this road and carrying these passengers with us. So right now with a grouping of spread, which, we, which is what we've got here, each one of these cars has, um, each has one passenger in it. Now, if so, you, and you can see here, for example, that all those channels are evenly allay, um, distributed along that curve there. Now, if we were to go to something like a grouping of two, change this effect that's playing back to a grouping of two, right? Now we can see all these passengers shove into two cars. So we've taken all those channels and they're playing back at two points along this effect. And we change this to a grouping of, say, four. Right now, we're taking all those channels and we're shoving them in into groupings of, into four cars. Right. Um, we can also have the grouping. We can have more cars on the road than there are passengers. Right. So let's, you know, we're in the age of autonomous vehicles. We've got a bunch of cars that have passengers in them and a bunch of them don't. So right now, I've got these ten channels in, in augmented here running in a grouping of four. But if I change that to a grouping of twenty, you're actually going to see this effect run. I'm actually going to make this hard edged and not soft edged, so it's a little easier to see. And you can see it actually goes all the way white, and then it goes all the way black, all the way light, all the way black. And that's because this effect continues to run on channels that aren't there. Or in other words, all of the channels squeeze into the first 10 cars, and then the second 10 cars are empty. Okay. So this is directly related in a lot of ways to trail. So if we think of uh, grouping, uh, if we think of grouping as the number of cars, trails is the distance between those cars. So I'm going to go ahead once again, and I'm going to change this back to spread here. Uh, da -da -da, great. So trail, it's going to evenly distribute these cars on the road. So right now, we are seeing that at any given time, half these channels are dark and half of them are light, and that's because we are e we are doing math and we're evenly distributing this. 
Now, if I change my trail to solo here, right, we are going to have just one car going down the road at a time. And here we can see just one car, light the next car, light the next car, light. If we do a trail of 50%, right, one light's going to get halfway through and the next light's going to go. So we can see that as one light turn, starts turning on, the next one turns off, the next one turns off, the next one turns off. Again, because we are right now, we're looking at a effect that is, uh, da -da -da, right, we're looking at an effect here that's a zero over a background state. So remember that our on state, if you will, in this case, is zero, not background. Right, we change our trail to say 25%, these cars are gonna get closer together. Right, so as we increase this trail, these cars are gonna get closer together. Change it to 10, you can see that these cars get closer together. So what this really results in is that as the trail gets narrower, narrower, right, our band, right, if I change this to a trail of one, our band gets wider. Okay, so we can see here we have a wider band. So we, we often are using trail to control the size of the band that we're running. Let's go back in here. All right, so let's go back in the live. Let's stop this effect. All right, so we're going to actually use our background over zero effect because I think it's a little easier to see. One through 10. I'm going to grab that. We're going to run this effect. I'm going to make this hard edged again just because I think it's can be a little easier to a little easier to see. Right, so now we have this spread. Oops, missed, missed one. Um, we have this band running. Uh, if we come in here and we sure enough, if we shorten this bar to ten, right, we can see that we are shortening or shorten the grouping to ten. We can see that we're. I'm sorry. Oops, did you? I'm in the wrong part of the demo. <laughs> As we shorten this trail to 10, we're going to shorten it. If we make it even shorter, let's say it's 5%, we're making this, this longer. We make it 1%, we're making it even longer. We're, ha we're elongating this band. Right. So what if, okay, cool, I, like, I use a trail of 3, and I like the length of this band, but now I want more dark space in between, because right now it's still using a grouping, using a grouping of spread, if I had set this demo up correctly. I can actually, and a grouping of spread, by the way, and a grouping of 10 in this case is actually the same because we have 10 lights. So you didn't see any change there. If I change this to a grouping that is larger than the number of lights I have, say 20, mm -hmm, I'm actually going to increase that dark space. Change it to a grouping of 40. Again, right, we're going to have more dark space in between our light bursts. All right, if we want less dark space, we can decrease this. Maybe I'll decrease this to a grouping of 7. Now, there is a balance between trail and grouping because it takes a certain amount of time for the effect to cycle back on itself. So you can see here, we didn't end up quite with those bars. So I may need to play with it a little bit until I get into a place, try like a grouping of 10. Here. Yeah, there you go. Um, all right, so all of these things are also related because we can also use our second step here to increase this dark time because each one of these steps is how long each one of these actions has a time of how long it's an action. So if I actually, if I want, say, cool, I like this, I just want to make my dark bar bigger, well, I'll just increase the dwell time in my second step to two. And now I've basically doubled the length of that dark bar. Right? If I make it four, I've quadrupled the length of that dark bar. And now this is, of course, related to trail and grouping, and you're always doing this kind of this delicate balance between all these to get the effect that you're looking for. Right. So let's go ahead, and I'm going to reset these to their default. All right, so we've talked about using trail to control the length of this, right? Again, I can make it longer by making it a trail of one. I can make it shorter by making it a trail of 40, right? which is almost the same as a trail of 50, right? So it's almost every other. So here, for example, a trail of 20 is this kind of this three light pattern. Uh, what if we want this to run down every bar? Well, that's where one of the places where grouping would come into play. So we use grouping on this single bar here. Let me come in here and I'm going to grab all of these bar cans and I'm going to apply that effect. And you're going to see right now it's just going to run to do bar cans. Oh, they don't have a background state. There we go. Um, 
and it's going to run along all these par cans in sequence. If we want, if we wanted it to run down every bar, okay. Well, I'm going to come in here, and I will change my grouping to 10. Right, and now it's running down every bar. It's repeating every 10. It's grouping these in groups of 10. Uh, I can make this look a little better. I think this effect looks kind of lame. Let's go ahead and make it kind of a trail effect. Yeah, I'll speed it up so it kind of looks a little sexier. I don't know how well that will render for all of you out there in the internet world, but uh, it looks pretty good here. Uh, so I've got this, this burst effect now. Well, what if I want more of a rain? This is a little too symmetrical for me. Well, I can use this grouping to offset these bursts from each other. So say I want them, you know, one bar's worth offset from each other. Well, I know these are bars of 10. If I change my grouping to 15, right now they're offset from each other by five. If I want the groupings further, if I want these bursts further apart, change to like 19, right? I'm increasing the distance between these bursts because I'm increasing the grouping. Uh, if I want more of a random feel, well, I know this is an even number, right? There are 40 lights here. Let me try something random. Let me try an, an odd number, like 27, right? And that's, always, that's not necessarily always going to group in a consistent manner. So now it feels a little more random. You know, grouping of 32, right? It's going to feel a little, it's just going to feel different. And I can use grouping to control now the distance of these bursts. And I still have this trail to control the tail of these effects. All right, so here I've just made that effect longer by, increasing, by decreasing the trail to 5%. So I can use trail and grouping to start to determine how these effects look. Um, and again, this is all just with a, you know, a single background step. All right, eh, park hands, you know, I, nothing new to probably most of you guys. So let's take this one step further. Now we can, all, we can also use grouping to provide some directionality to these effects. So I'm going to stop these, get, them, get rid of them. Uh, so we have these X bars here in the background. And I want to run some interesting chases across these. So I'm going to create a new effect. Oops. Create effect three here. This is the point of the show where I get lazy and I kind of stop labeling stuff. So you know what? I won't. The world is watching. Um, good habits matter, right? Another background zero for the X bars. Right. So I have this other def this default effect now again with the trail of grouping and spread. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to run this on those X bar cells that are back there. These are multi-cell fixtures. Um, they are patches, multi-cell fixtures I have. For my convenience here, you can see I have an X bars masters and X bar uh, cells group here. I'm also running the master intensity of the X bars out of a submaster for the, the for this demo. So I can just make sure that they're up at full and I'm not always messing with that. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to grab those lights and I'm going to run this effect. And here we go. I've got this linear effect running left to right. And why? Because the channel selection order for these X bars was put in in the order of these lights, 501 through 530, and it's just running them linear, linearly. Right. So let's come into our effect and let's see how we can use grouping to manipulate how this effect appears. Right? We already know that I can use trail to affect the tail. Right? I can make it smaller here. So 5% is going to make that bar shorter. All right, make it bar longer, rather. It's going to make that bar longer. Um, and there's some interesting stuff when you get into numbers of lights that are this large, right? Because right now, even, if I choose a trail of even, do, oh, I'm wrong. <laughs> working in the wrong effect. Um, if I make this trail of even, um, you know, it looks like my bar is really wide. And it's like, oh, well, wait, like one is, you know, 1% 1 is supposed to make this bar wider. That bar got shorter. Why is that? Well, because the console can do more math than we can do in trail, right? So unfortunately in trail, I'm limited through 1% through 200% or I can probably go higher. I've never really tried. Um, so if I change this to a trail of like 5%, right, I'm going to see I'm still getting that shorter bar, but the widest that I can make it using trail is one. And this is where I might want to use my background state timing. Hey, David. To make this Sorry, we, yeah. we can't see your, uh, your viz. Oh, ha, <laughs> ha. There we go. I can see thank the you, sir. You can, thank you. Yeah, I don't have a confidence monitor. Um, I'm just going to leave this screen up. Um, so yeah, so I can use, as I was saying here, um, I can make this bar shorter, right? Or I can make this bar wider using my trail. 
Um, but if I want something like this, I'm going to have to use a combination of my step timing and my trail to achieve that. But let's go ahead and let's keep this even for now. And let's say I want this to run, right now it's running vertically from the top to the bottom. Let's say I want this to sweep left to right. Well, I know that each of these X bars has 20 pixels. Let me change my grouping to 100. And now I'm going to change the directionality of that effect running left to right, because it's grouping these together in sets of 100. So now I'm moving that left to right. What if I want, I like this, but I actually want two bars running across. Well, if I divide this grouping, if I'm getting one bar with a grouping of 100, if I change this to 50, I'm going to get two bars running across. If I change it to 25, I'm going to get four bars running across because it's a halving and a doubling, and it's still doing that math, and it's basically re, it's rerunning the effect, or it's, um, it's recycling through every 25 fixtures. But then I can use numbers that aren't even to apply additional directionality to this. So let's say instead of doing something that divides nicely by 100, I do something like a grouping of 75. Now we get kind of these diagonal effects because it's offsetting each one of these, and I get this kind of diagonal look. If I want it to go, let's say I want it to go from the bottom left to the upper right, I can, I can choose the 125, and it's going to offset in the other direction. So now I can start getting this, providing directionality with these effects just by using grouping. Um, and I can, I of course, still have all the benefits of my trail to make this shorter and longer if I want. Right, so now I kind of have this cool, uh, this cool trail effect here, and then I can make it longer or shorter depending on how my trail and my grouping interact. What if I want, I love this effect, but I want it to run in the other direction. Well, this is where offset becomes in, comes into the picture. It's like, oh, great. I love this effect, just make it run backwards. Right? EOS cares a lot about channel selection order. We have this great tool for channel selection order, offset, it's, and it's gotten even better in 3.0. Uh, so I'm gonna go into my offset tools. First thing you might notice is, hey, I've got this cool new offset graphic. Awesome, that's kind of gonna show me what my channel selection order is, and particularly if I'm running effects, the order that they're gonna run. So I'm actually going to come here and I'm going to reverse this. Now we actually see that little yellow bar moves from right to left. I'm going to take that and now I'm going to run my X-bar effect. And it's going to run in the other direction because the grouping in this case is handling the diagonal look. And we are using offset uh, to handle the directionality. All right, cool. So let's go ahead and stop that effect. Let's create a new effect. Let's create effect four. You're going to be absolute. We'll start you looking the same way, and then we'll change you later. Should be zero. Great. All right. So now uh, let's take the same effect. We're going to grab our X bar cells here. You're going to run that effect. Great. Same, same thing. Let's see how using offset is similar to grouping, because offset, offset and grouping share a lot of things in common. Uh, and then you can also combine those and to like stack that grouping order. So I've got all of these selected. If I choose to uh, offset, if I choose to use offset with a number of groups of say 100, and then I run that effect. Um, I'm sorry, I meant to do. It's going to look the same. Why is it going to look the same? Because it's right. They're in series of 100. But if what I meant to do is a number of groups and I interleave them, interleave is going to shuffle that stuff like a deck of cards, right? So now, uh, number of groups, and I want number of groups 100, and I want to interleave it, and I want to run that effect. And now I've got that left to right bar, because again, I'm using that 100, and remember that 100 is every 100 pixels, and then I am interleaving those together. So I'm using the first pixel from the first line, and the first pixel from the second line, and the first pixel from the third line, first pixel from the fourth line, so on and so forth. And now I can use... I can, the benefit is, is I can work within this and I can use grouping and trail inside of this uh, to further manipulate it. So I can still have, right, I still have control of the length of this with my trail here. If I change it to five, right, it's going to be shorter. Change it to two, it's going to lengthen it out a little bit. Um, and I can also still use grouping. So now let's say I change uh, the grouping here to 50. Again, I'm getting that same look that I did before, but now the left to rightness, if you will, 
of this effect is baked in in the channel selection. So now I don't have to worry about necessarily working in group multiples of um, multiples of 100 to keep that. Right? If I come in here and I change this to a grouping of 75 now, right? remember before a grouping of 75 gave me that kind of diagonal look because it was offsetting the lines. Well now, because that, those lines, that horizontal chase is locked in at the channel selection order level, I can use grouping to manipulate how, uh, you know, how big this line is, how frequent this line is, right? Because again, this is just the repeat. So it's cool. So I can start to combine these in really interesting ways to get the effect that I want, right? So what else? Now we've started kind of diving into offset. Uh, what else do I have at my disposal there to work with? So let's go back into, let's go back into live here and let's reselect these fixtures. And also notice that when I use my selection tools here, um, I act, when I use select last, I actually get this offset back on my command line. So I, that's, I use that a lot as a shortcut so I don't have to continually hit the soft key for offset to get into that. Um, so let's go ahead and actually, I think what I do is let's change this back to the default here. Great. So let's reselect this, and now we're going to select this whole group. And what if I just want it to go from the center out? I want, the, I want it to chase up and down. I want it to mirror the whole group out. Well, I have that mirror out. You guys are probably most, I think a lot of you who especially do effects often are familiar with mirror out. And I can run that. And we can see I have this linear chase running, because without any other modifiers, this is going to run in the channel selection order. And it divided this channel selection order in half, and it's running it top to bottom. So now, because I've defined this at the selection level, I can then use my grouping and trail like I would expect to manipulate, for example, the tail of the selection. So if I want shorter bars, I can use trail to make the bars shorter or longer. And by the way, remember, if I say I'm down to 1% on the trail, I'm like, oh, I just want it a little longer, and I can't go any shorter than trail, well, that's when you can dip back into my dwell time here. I can come in here, I can double the dwell time, and it's going to increase the length of that bar. So there is this interplay between the step timing and the, the trail timing. Or, um, so let's set that back to one, and set this back to spread, or even, rather. Right, and then I can also have my, group. I can still maintain that grouping. So again, I can use this grouping to adjust frequency here. So now I have you know, two bars running to the right on the top, and two bars running to the left on the bottom. And it's because I've mirrored the selections and then I'm using the groupings within those mirrored selections. Uh, cool. Uh, I don't know if anything's coming up, any questions coming up about this yet, but um, all right. So we've dealt with how offset and grouping and trail kind of begin to interact. Well, what about those diagonals? Is there a way to do that from the offset? Well, yes. So I'm going to grab those lights again. And now, let's, let's use our offset and let's use our number of groups. And right, we remember these numbers from before. Remember, 75 is what made those go in our diagonals before. So a grouping of 75. Uh, oops, keep reading and interleave them because I'm looking at the monitor. Oops. Right, so now we've got kind of those diagonals again. Okay. Because, now why did I need to choose interleave there? Well, because remember, interleaves is going to shuffle that. So we can actually look at the difference, right? If I just have this number of groups 75 effect 4, it's going to break this into 75 groups. But those 75 groups are going to be linear, and we can actually see that down here. So it's actually doing these in blocks of 8. If I interleave it, you can see it's actually picking a different cell from each fixture. And that's what gives me that diagonal feel. So if, another way to think about it is grouping at the effects level is always doing an interleave. If we want that same sort of behavior out of offset, we need to make sure to specify interleave. I want my grouping of 125 and interleave it. It's going to go that diagonal lower left to upper right, just like we did in grouping. But now we can use, again, the benefit of doing this at the offset level is we're not hamstrung by the effect because now we can do whatever we want inside the effect and that's totally available to us. So again, I can adjust, you know, trail wouldn't necessarily affect as much of it, but grouping, well, that's probably a terrible grouping for that, but now I can use my grouping to do all sorts of interesting stuff within that selection order. And again, this is kind of a uh, example here of like a snake eating its tail. 
um, where it's, you know, it's running a little too fast for the grouping and it's catching up with itself a little bit. But actually, I think it's kind of a neat effect. Uh, again, and if we want more, remember, if we want finer grained control that we can get with trail, so say we wanted these bars to be thinner, again, I can just increase my background state here. Say that I might uh, change this to 0.5, right? And I'm going to get these thinner bars. I can manipulate that dark space and that light space by depending on how long these dwells are. All right, so that's stuff we've already had. Um, it's stuff that you may have already played with. None of this may be new to you. There's a bunch of cool new features in 3.0 for offset tools that really take this to the next level. Uh, and that's why we started kind of here at the ground up and built up because I think it's really important to get these, these basics down before we kind of get a little more advanced. Hey, David, before, we, yeah. before we hop on, I've got a question from John. Um, yeah. You know, it's obviously the video quality across the internet is a little choppy, so it's a little oh, hard boy. to see. But um, it's, it's okay. I think we can generally see what's going on. His question is in one of the details, and that's, um, you know, when you're using trail, does the mm -hmm. intensity fade off of the trail like a comet, uh, or is it the same intensity as the start of the trail? Um, and I, I think that's a, a good question and maybe a, a good way to talk about, like, what if you want something solid versus what if you want something that's a bit more tapered? Yeah, that's a great idea. And hopefully this may be making it a little bigger, makes it a little easier to see. So trail, right, is to remember trail is just the distance between these cars. It's just the different distance. Um, it's just the different distance between these groups, basically. So, you know, I've been using a trail of 1%, but trail doesn't actually change the nature of the effect. It's just changing the, the, the distance. If I wanted to change, say I wanted this to be like a comet, right, I would actually have to change my second, my second step here, my second action. So if I wanted this to act like a comment, well, right now is, this is what I call a hard-edged effect, right, or a square wave effect, because it's on and then off, and there's no fade in between. If I wanted to add a fade here, I would just put a time value into this second, this second field, this time field here. And now I'm going to get that fade like a comment. So if I change this grouping to, say, 50, oh, okay. not, really great with the, um, not really great with the what we have going on here, but... Right, we can see here that I have this trail, and, uh, and there's a comet trail, but the comet trail here is due to the second level. It's not due to the fact that um, it's not, it has nothing to do with trail in and of itself. So here's like a grouping of, this is kind of the default, right? That grouping of spread trail of even, that trail is coming from the second line. It's not coming from trail itself. Trail is going to affect that distance, right? So if I make this a trail of 10, Right? These are going to be very small, and you get very small comments. Again, if we wanted to make that tail a little longer, I can make this a, make it very dramatic. A 10 second, right? So now here I have a 10 second, basically down fade, if you will, into the zero step. Speed it up so you can see it. So I'm making that tail longer, and I can make that tail longer in a couple ways. I can use, do it using trail. I can also do, use it doing the timing on the second step. Great. Uh, that, that's that makes amazing. Sense. Yeah, I think that was a really good explanation. Um, uh, another quick question. Um, uh, Stephen asked how you would mirror out the bars. Um, oh, we're getting to that. If uh, if the current channel order is top to top to bottom. So. Oh, you know I mean? we've got a whole mirror out section right. coming here, buddy. We will. Uh, you just... We will delay that until that section runs. So. Um, Just you wait. Ah, <laughs> you read my mind. That's what's uh, that's what's coming up next. A whole section on mirror out because mirror Amazing. out just got a lot more powerful. Great. Um, so why don't we dig in? That's all the questions that I, I have for now. I hear you. I hear you through the internet. All right. <laughs> all right. So uh, look, yeah. So a lot, a lot of questions on mirror out. Well, we've been using mirror out. We can now, if we go into our offset tools here. I'm going to leave this weird because we get our offset window kind of framed nicely here. We have a bunch of different options. We notice now here at the top of this left-hand column, we actually get direction plus number. So I can now append anything in this first column with a number. Why would I want to do that? Because it's awesome, right? So I've selected all these X-bar cells. I want to mirror them out. But you know what? I'm going to mirror out six. Now let's apply that effect. Right now, I am doing a mirror out on each of these bars because I am repeating that every six, right? So you can actually kind of see here at the bottom, we have a lot of pixels 
um, that we can't see, but it's actually doing the, you know, the first set and the second set, it's, and it's applying six mirror out to this. It makes this look a little cool by changing our trail back to even. Ah, too fast. All right, so we can see we're mirroring out from the top to the bottom. All right, cool. What if I want to reverse this? Well, there's one, you know, one trick about this is that these things don't stack, um, which is kind of unfortunate. So for example, if I wanted this, I, I love this effect. It's building mirror out from the top to the bottom, but I wanted to go from the bottom to the top. It's actually a bit of a two-step process. So I'm gonna grab my X-bar cells there. Let me go back to this view here. Uh, I'm gonna grab these X-bar cells. I'm gonna offset them reverse. Right, so now I'm doing them in a reverse order because that channel selection order matters. And I'm going to record that as this group here. I'm gonna call that X bar reverse. Got my caps lock on. X bar reverse. All right, so now I have this channel selection order. So now if I was just to do that same thing, mirror out six and apply this, now it's going to do that mirror out from the bottom to the top. Right, because we're just again we're applying six mirrored out. We're dividing that by six. Um, so the, you know to, that to reverse that it's a two-step process. What else can we do with this? Right. So now we have this grouping. Um, well, we can go ahead and let's reselect that. So let's say I wanted every other one of these lines going in opposite directions. Let me grab our X bar cells again grab our offset, mirror out, but I'm actually only gonna apply three mirror outs. There are six lines here. So when I do this, what I'm gonna get is I'm, actually, I'm gonna get every line going in an opposite, going in the opposite direction. Now remember, I still have grouping to control how many of these bars that I want because I'm doing the channel selection. So if I change this grouping to like 20, and I get now get all of these bars um, moving in opposite directions. So it's a really quick way for me to get this kind of opposing is a posing look. All right, so that's cool. Um, what if I what if I want them sunk up? Let me reselect those X bar cells, offset, mirror out six, interleave. Right now they're going to be sunk up again because we're using interleave now. So before it was running down that channel selection. Now we're using interleave to make this sync up. And what if we want each line to run as its own? Well, right now we're using a grouping of 20 and that's what's giving that kind of wave feel. If I change my grouping back to spread right? we're just gonna get the whole thing mirroring out together. And of course, mirroring in would do the opposite direction. Um, right. So again, if we did like our mirror out, mirror out three interleave, we ran that. Right now we're gonna get kind of this sunk up ships passing in the night sort of feel. And we can change that to a grouping of like say 50 and we're gonna get multiple bars. And again, all of the trail rules still apply here as far as making that bar longer and shorter. We can use our different levels to make this longer, um, to make the dark space longer or the bright space longer. Uh, just want to make sure I covered everything I wanted to talk about that. Um, the, the big benefit here is again, we're not getting locked into grouping at the effect level. We're getting, we're using the grouping at the channel level. All right, so let's say we want, um, we can, you know, we can use, I'm trying to, sorry, I'm trying to read my notes here as well. Uh, all right, so we want to, uh, we can also use this to control like density, right? So I'm gonna create another effect. Let me go ahead and stop this effect here. Um, I'm gonna create a new effect. I'm gonna create effect five. Oops. Thank you. And I have here, I, uh, I did make a full white preset, uh, which is going to bring these, these pixels to full in white. Imagine that. Uh, and I'm, so I can, I'm gonna use that to start, I want maybe to do like a little bit of a random strobe sort of effect. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna create a full white over a background state effect. 
that's fine. I'll leave it. It'll look a little bit like a sparkle because it's all fade and no dwell, right? So it's going to fade on and then immediately start fading off. So kind of feels kind of sine wavy. It's technically sort of like a sawtooth, but all right, so I'm going to go back into live and I'm going to apply that to my X bar cells again. And it's like, okay, cool. It works like we expect. It's running from the top to the bottom. Um, I can, I want to make this look, you know, look a little nicer. So first thing I'm going to do, well, let's take these cells, let's make them red. So we're running it maybe over red. And I'm going to take those cells and I'm going to put them at 50 so it's a little brighter. Right. So first thing we're going to do, right, if we want a random chase, we're actually going to randomize this, right? Offset random. And I've got this little shimmer sparkle. Not bad for right off the bat. But now we can use these things we've learned about grouping and trail to further um, to make this sparser or denser. So if I come back into my effect editor now, right? Um, I want to make this, I'm gonna start here at making this 1%, trail of 1%. Uh, reason being is because there are, I know there are more lights here than I can do anything with with trail. Like anything, I know that anything larger than one is actually gonna make my trail sparser, is actually gonna make my, my density sparser, right? If I change this to like a trail of 5%. Right, I'm actually, it's going to be sparser because I, there's more than 100 lights. So 1% is about as small as I can get. So now I can either use my dark and my light timing, but that's going to affect how long these fades take. And that's not really what I want to do because I don't want it. I like the speed at which it's working. I just want it denser. So, but, so this is another place with a random selection where grouping can be our friend. Now remember, the no total number of pixels can also be, so spread is this, in this case is the same as a grouping of 600, because we have 600 pixels here. So if I want twice the density, let me do a grouping of 300. And I'm gonna double the density of this strobe effect. I want four times the density, do a grouping of 150. Right? And I'm gonna basically, I'm, you know, I'm grouping this into 150 groups and it's going to effectively double the density here. Um, I can affect this off time, right, if I want, you know, I can find a fine tune this sparseness by using the um, the timing of my background state to work within this to really kind of fine tune that and dial that in. Let me change this to like 10 seconds here. I can see again we're back to this very sparse look, um, and I can work between grouping and my background state here to 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 fine tune the density of this. And if I want it to be on a little longer, of course I can change my dwell time to one, and then the on state, right? The strobe will happen for longer. If I want it to be pops and not fades, I would just change this, right? So just like, remember, trail doesn't affect that fade off, trail just affects the distance between these. So here I have a trail one and they're just kind of doing their, doing their little poppy thing. So this is pretty good, but I want it to be a little blockier. Um, I, you know, I want this work in blocks of let's say two or three. Again, this is another one of those two steps processes because we can't yet, although we will soon, hopefully, be able to stack these offsets. So I'm gonna come back into live here and I'm gonna actually grab those X-bar cells again. And uh, I'm going to come into offset here. And now if I do random number of, uh, sorry, channels per group three, it's going to randomly put three cells into each group. And that's not what I want. I want to be able to randomize blocks of three. So again, this is a making, this is kind of a two-step process. I'm gonna grab that. I'm gonna say I want three channels per group. I'm gonna put that into a group here. I'm gonna call that box three. All right. So now if I run this, um, Right now, it's just gonna run linearly. So what I wanna do then is I wanna grab that group, which contains this in this, these subgroups, right? These blocks of three subgroups. And then I wanna randomize that. So I'm gonna take that, and you can see that it shows up here in my channel selection order as these blocks of three. So when I randomize that, it's gonna randomize those blocks. So now, as I run this, right, we are having this random popping on blocks of three. So if I wanna do this kind of blocking, uh, is it, I want to make sure I want to make the group that contains the blocks of three first, and then I want to apply a random to that. Uh, let's say we want to create a look on stage where 
every other X bar is mirroring out. So first one's mirroring in, the second one's mirroring out, the third one's mirroring in, the fourth one's mirroring out, so on and so forth. Um, that would be a really time consuming process to type in manually. So luckily we have some offset tools here to help us with that. Uh, I'm going to stop the effect just as pretty as it is, so we're not kind of looking at two things at once. Let me reset this effect here. Do one and one and zero. Awesome. All right, so first thing we want to do is, this is a, again another two-step process. Um, first thing we want to do is we want to create a situation where we have all the lights mirroring out together. Right? Well, there are 30 lights, so I know that I want to use a mirror out of 30. So if I was to grab these X-bar cells and mirror them out, 30, and run that effect, now it looks like it, it doesn't look like it's doing it, but if we slow this effect way down, oops, other direction on the encoder, yeah, let's do like 10 seconds. Right? You actually can, well, I can see here, I'm sure it's probably pretty choppy on the interwebs, but uh, they're actually going in order and mirroring out in order. So uh, then what we're going to do is we want to record this as a group. Now, I don't need to run the effect to, to record this. I just am running it to kind of show, to kind of show what, uh, what's happening. So we have my offset mirror out 30, and I want to record this as mirror out. And then I'm going to actually use select last uh, twice, right? That will repopulate two selections ago. And I'm going to say mirror in 30. Now, if I, write, if I run that effect, we can see that it's mirroring in one at a time. Right? So I now have all the lights mirroring in, all the lights mirroring out. I only care about the channel selection order at this point. I know this isn't what we want the effect to look like. I'm going to record this as mirror in. Okay, so now there's this great new function called, um, oh, sorry, the last thing we need to do is we need to create the destination groups. And we don't need to do it, but it's going to make our lives a, a little faster. So I'm going to stop this effect here. And what I want to do is I want to grab all of my X bars and I want to offset them to, I'm going to record, oops, oops, fat fingered, offset to, record you, uh, call you. One of two, and now I've got this great tool. I so I, I selected every other group here, um, which is what's in group 15. So you can see here on the right hand side, right? Group channel 501 is selected, channel 502 is not. Well, I want the other set. So I'm going to come in and offset, and I'm just going to say, oops, actually, I'm going to do, 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 do. Let me grab group six, offset two, and I'm going to say invert. And what invert's going to do is invert is going to invert that channel selection order, right? So before I had 501, 503, 505, 507, I click invert, it's going to invert that. So now I'm getting 502, 504, 506, 508, so on and so forth. So this is the, the lights that weren't previously selected um, in the other selection. Uh, in, the, in, a two, in an offset of two, that's not so bad, right? One, two, but maybe I want uh, one group to have every fourth light and the, another group to have the other three lights that aren't in the other group. And invert's a great tool for that. And I'm going to record this as two of two. So now I have my, um, basically like my source and my destination groups. So I'm going to grab every other light. I only care about the cells, so I'm going to post cell to my command line. And then I want to use this really cool uh, really cool tool called recall from group. Uh, to do, you know what, did that not, to do, to do, to do. should have posted. Sorry, guys, should have posted. Oh, I think it'll work anyway. Uh, order from group. And what this is going to do is this is actually going to take a group order from another group. So remember I had made that mirror out group, so I'm going to go ahead and, oh, I can't tap on that yet, but they just fixed that in the SCR. Uh, I'm going to type in uh, group 16 here. So now I have group 15, which are those ev the one of two X bars, right? I want to grab just the cells, and I want to rec recall that order, which is that mirrored out from group 16. And now I'm going to run that effect. Right? And we can see that, awesome, 
every other one is running that mirrored out. Great. Let's do the same for the other one. 25 cells only, offset order from group, 26. And then I'm going to run that effect. And now we have every second one running in. So now we have you know, bars 1, 3, 5, so on and so forth running out, bars 2, 4, 6 running in. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to record this as Q1. I should do this because I have other stuff going on. So now I have this effect and it is doing this, this. Well, okay, that's cool. That may not be exactly what I wanted it to do. Um, but it's the rough bones are there. I can see that the lights are playing back like I would expect. Now I can use my grouping to really fine tune this and make it look how I want. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to use, let's say I make a grouping of 20. Right, grouping of 20, now every bar is going to be doing this together, right? So all the bars are mirroring out and mirroring in together. Speed that up a little bit so it looks a little better. Um, do a grouping of 40. Right now, it's like every other bar. Grouping of 60, right? So on and so forth. So we can really begin to use this to make interesting, interesting looks, right? This is my grouping of 100. And you remember that grouping of 100 goes from left to right. So it's still doing that. Um, it's just doing it with this mirror out, mirror in. So I'm, I've created this look. You know, if I do a grouping of like 10. So again, I can use this to kind of create some interesting effects. Um, and this, common, this, this order from group functionality is really powerful because I can have groups that are specifically ordered, uh, in this case, like these mirrored out. And I can use just one light from that order. Uh, and that becomes a really powerful tool because a lot of times I spend a lot of time fine tuning, um, say, the directionality of the X bar or a BI or a magic panel or something like that. Um, but I just want to be able to apply an effect to one light in that order. Uh, this order from group tool is really, is really, really powerful. All right. Uh, oh, cool. It's, about, it's almost about 9 o'clock. Um, so that's good. So I'm going to move on because I do want to touch on break mode and variables. So that's kind of where we're going to move next. Uh, is there any, anything else we want to touch on here before we move, before we move on? Yeah, I think, um, I think there's, a, there's a couple of questions. Uh, I also, you know, the the uh, the offset um, recall from group order tool, you know, this is also useful outside of effects, right? Um, basically, the point of that tool in, in anything is that you have a, a group that you've recorded. And what we used to do is if we wanted to access little chunks of that big group, we would have to record individual smaller groups um, so that we could do that. Uh, this is on the fly. You can say, I have this big system that I'm dealing with in a complicated nonlinear order, and I want to be able to apply uh, uh, whatever I'm doing, uh, discrete timing or an effect or, or you know, maybe a distributed intensities yeah. on just a subset of those without having to re-remember that group. So it is particularly useful in effects. But I think that that little button is going to be useful for all sorts of other features in the desk. Um, so again, that's a 3.0 thing. I, I really encourage you to um, explore what it can do to you um, because I think that it, uh, it limits now the amount of groups that you have to create in order to deal with bigger systems, which is, is pretty awful. Um, so I think that's useful. Uh, David, a couple questions came in that had to do um, mostly with like workflow when you're dealing with some of these things. Um, Jake asks, when you're recalling these specific effects and the grouping combinations, um, are you saving these looks as a preset or keeping note of how you arrive at a specific look? You know, as you build up these things, this effect on these channels, how are you dealing with uh, reproducing that, with getting back to that known state um, in a predictable way, in a fast way? Okay. I mean, so definitely, um, Definitely presets, definitely presets and effects, right, are a good way to, I have this look and I want to remember this look and I want to go back to that look. And if we have time at the end, we'll do a little, a little preset and effect sidebar um, or effects and preset sidebar. But I mean, presets and effects are great. Um, you know, mo 
90% of my effects are these absolute two-step effects. And then uh, you can get most of what you need done with grouping offset trail. Um, what I will do is I will actually copy these effects and I will a lot of times use a specific effect for a specific purpose. So I'll have my, my base bank of effects and then, cool, we're doing this look and I'll maybe, maybe if I'm doing a scene, I'll have a bank of effects for that scene and I'll copy that base effect into that bank of effects and then I'll make my adjustments adjustments there um, because then you know a lot of times I don't want to adjust the base effect that I'm recalling from or that I'm using to build that but I I do want the tools being able to manipulate trail and timing and all that without affecting everything else in my show um, if it's specific to channel selection order like we're talking about here with the recall from group this is a great use for presets um, because the presets will also recall or will also remember that channel selection order so if it's like it needs to be this channel selection order and this grouping and this uh, trail and this different effect line combination. I will do both. I will copy that effect to a dedicated effect that I'm using for that scene and then I'll record that into a preset so that I make sure that that channel selection order is maintained for inevitably when I break it at some point uh, and I need to get back to it. Really. Excellent. Um, another sort of workflow thing, Brandon, hey Brandon, uh, also yeah. asks, um, uh, the tools that you've been explaining are really great with, with sort of the same number of fixtures on every position, um, you know, really symmetrical, uh, really well uh, mirrored rigs and things like that. How would you handle building your offsets and subgroups with positions and rigs that have sort of mixed quantities um, of, of fixtures? Do you still want to achieve that mirror or, or wipe effects? Um, you have to build that stuff manually, or there are smart ways to do it. What are some of your thoughts if you reach um, a, a non-symmetrical rig that you want to do symmetrical things to? I mean, that's where it depends. That you know, that's where you could always go in and manually subgroup it, right? That's one way to do it. It's like, cool, it's these channels and these channels and these channels. But yeah, these are groups of ten, but I could do it in, um, you know, I could select groups of nine and still use those tools. Um, a lot of times, like if, especially with like a rock and roll thing, if there's a center fixture, a lot of times I'll just, depending on how much time I have, I'll just ignore it, um, or I'll in, or I'll record the group and then I'll go ahead and I'll insert that where it needs to be in the group after the fact. Um, but yeah, I mean a lot of these tools that are where the console is doing the distribution for you, it's definitely better served for symmetrical things. Um, but I mean, I guess as a programmer, we don't have any control of it, but I feel like designers should be making symmetrical rigs if they want symmetrical looks. <laughs> so it doesn't answer the well, it doesn't answer the question, but like you know, I mean, we're never going to win, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I think at a certain point, you know, these these tools, from from my experience, um, you know, the the tools can't possibly predict every scenario that you're going to encounter, and and I think that part of um, being mature with these features in your knowledge is knowing when to abandon them as well, right? Like, you know, at a certain point, you got to sit there and punch in numbers. Uh, you know, there, there's going to be a need to sit and like say, okay, this is a goofy scenario. Uh, I need to take the time to, to prep myself um, because the board isn't always going to have the answers. Um, so I think being smart about it is, again, not only knowing what the tools are capable of, but knowing what the tools are not capable of. Uh, you know, sometimes it's just faster to, to hammer it in. So, um, you know, sometimes you, sometimes um, you just got to do that and record it as a group, and it's ugly and it takes a second, but then you have it. Like, if there is, I mean, I guess what I, I guess what the only thing I would say to that is like, okay, if this ugly channel selection order that I have down here, and I forgot ten, I had ten, Oops. um, and ten, right? If this channel selection, ugly channel selection order is what I need it to be. Okay, like I have come to peace with the fact that I have to type that once. There is no reason I should have to type that more than once because once I've done it, right? Oops, you're all seeing someone's birthday. Um, Must be nine o'clock. Yeah, nine o'clock. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, once I've typed that once, right? I'm going to select last. I'm going to store that to a group, and then I don't ever have to deal with it again. So you deal with it once. You know, yeah. it's kind of the it's kind of the philosophy like you do it more than twice, make a macro, right? If I'm if I'm going to be typing this group, all, if I'm going to be typing this channel section all the time, I'm going to make a group about it, and then 
you know, I am the king of the one channel group. Like I'm the first person to be like, it's that light. Um, you know, I don't remember group numbers, so I'm gonna I'm gonna put it in a group anyway. Yeah, and and Warren actually uh, chimed in. Hey, Warren, good to see you. Um, uh, using dummy channels, empty channels to to help um, with those distributions. So you know, inserting channels that aren't tied to real fixtures, but allow you to to work better with distributions. Um, good tip, Warren. That's that's something I've seen several partners use as well. So um, yeah. Um, a quick thing, uh, I think this is, is interesting. Andrew asks uh, for you to kind of describe um, what the, the differences are when you use uh, the, the reverse in, in an, an effect attribute, right? So being able to reverse the effect uh, versus reversing the channel selection. Um, you know, what, what, is, what are the pros and cons? What, you know, on the surface, it feels like those two would give you um, exactly the same thing, but I, I know you have more to discuss about that. Well, I mean, they're, they're, not, they're not the same thing, right? So if I was to um, grab these, these moving lights up here, right, and let me come in and let me create a new effect. Everyone will do this. That's a fat finger all over the place. Ooh, look, mom, I'm on TV. All right, so I've got my favorite little effect here. And you're talking about using this reverse here. Now remember, this is the reverse of the steps through the table. This isn't the reverse of the channel selection order. So they're very different. So if I was to grab those lights and I was to run this effect, I'm going that way. If I come in here into my effect, come on, come on me, great. And I was to reverse it, it's, going to still go the same way. It kind of takes a beat, but it's running backwards through the table. It's not running backwards across the channel selection. So if I want this to run backwards to the channel selection, I actually have to come in here and I have to reverse this channel selection order. So they're, 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 not, the, they're not the same. Um, the only place they are the same is if you're in a step-based effect because there's a channel selection order tied to those steps in the table. Yeah, well put. Thank you for, for clarifying that. Um, Really quickly, Scott asks, um, with us talking about macros, what sort of helpful macros do you use to alter the grouping in the trail without clicking on the effects editor? And I'm going to add my little uh, T to that, which is, um, you know, when are you choosing to change uh, the grouping in the trail in the effect versus when are you doing something like a Q-level override for that sort of stuff? Got it. Uh, I, you know, all of my macros for changing that stuff happen at the queue level. Um, I mean, I definitely have macro. I don't have them now, you know, not the show file is pretty blank, but I definitely have a, because I run off mostly stock effects and I run in a market that they want to see it right now. Like there's no time for like putting the wrong thing on stage and then finessing it. Like they want to see it right now. You, you know, I have macros that'll go in here and they'll, you know, they will come in here and they will actually, you know, I have one that changes the rate to 50. And I have one that changes the rate to 25, and one that changes the rate to 125. Uh, and uh, you know, so I can run an effect, hit that, and it's going to slow it down, or it's going to speed it up. Um, and honestly, at least in the markets that I work in, which I do a lot of film and television, high-end commercials, stuff like that, um, I can store that away. And if all I'm doing is changing the rate or the size a little bit, and I'm not making any like effect level change, that's fine. You know, the number of times like, cool, we just needed to do like. Uh, stroby thing. Oh, it's too fast. Oh, that's great. You know, there's, there's no reason I couldn't come in here and grab these lights, you know, randomize them, apply that effect. Oh, you know, that's great. We just need it to be a little faster. And then I just run my macro that makes it 150. Oh, that's great. Let's go. And we're going, and that's a macro push for me. And then I can just record that and move on with my life. Um, again, for things like feature films and television, uh, single camera television, I'm doing a lot more of that at the effect level, um, not all the time, right? Sometimes I'm doing it, but I'm doing a lot more of that effect level than I'll copy those effects in because that is archival. Um, and we may need to come back in that in three months or six months and reuse that exact same situation. Um, and if I need to recall these channels or I need to do something funny with them, um, it's just nice to have it all in, in, in one package. 
Um, yeah. But I, just, I look at them as different tools. Like, I don't know how to explain it. Like, I just don't, they're not the same tool to me. Well, and we, we sort of talk about this with, with a lot of things in the desk with, you know, presets and just everything, how you organize stuff. Um, you know, the way that you approach these sorts of tools, um, if you're doing a show, you're, you're banging it in as fast as you can, and then in 12 hours it's in the dumpster, you know, is, is very different than if you're bringing up the next Broadway show from off-Broadway to Broadway to, you know, 30 companies installed around the world with tours and, you know, like the archival nature of some of this stuff um, will change how you approach it, right? Like, do I have time in the venue to spend storing it away so that I can reference it later um, and, and be able to, to find it easily and know what it's going to do um, knowing that I'm going to need it later or do I just have to get it in and it doesn't matter that I never touch it ever again. So um, I think that that kind of rule can be applied to uh, a lot of, of things in the show. Um, Martin, before we move on, we'll move on in just a second, David, if you're ready. Um, so I don't know if yeah. you're um, sure. Martin was asking about the uh, uh, group, group from channels and, and kind of mm -hmm. uh, how that works. Um, basically, if you have a group, I'm just going to use a super simple example. If I've recorded a group, group one, that has channels one through 50 in it, in some magical order, right, not, not linear order, um, what I can then do uh, is say uh, channels one through 10, um, and then use that offset uh, recall order from group. And, and what that will do is just take those channels that I've already put on the command line and reorder them in the way that they are in that group. Um, you can use a group uh, as a part of that. So instead of saying channels one through 10, you can use a different group number, and it will reorder those channels. Um, but you kind of are in a space where um, you know you need those channels to be in that second group in order for it to pick the order. Um, if not, it's just going to ignore those channels, right? So, um, so play with the feature, get comfortable with it. Um, again, I think it's one of those simple things that was added, that's going to save uh, a lot of time in the long run when people kind of get comfortable uh, with how it functions. So thanks for that. Uh, so David, yeah. you have to hop on to the next step. So. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I got, I got doing uh, order, order from group now stuff, you know, uh, 16 at 0 through 100. Um, oh, it helps if I turn Yeah, and those. I think, you know, a couple of people have mentioned this already. There's that new graphic in 3.0 in the offset window which gives you a little determination of, you know, how those tools are clicking together and lumping your channels together. Um, you know, we're trying to give you some visual indication of, uh, you know, if I do mirror out and interleave and group by five, what's happening, right? So um, I think that that little tool is a really, really useful addition to, to help out, especially as these offset tools can get a little bit more complicated. Um, and hopefully yeah, you know, like, see the selection you want before you even apply it to stage. Yeah, exactly. Like here we can see like, oh cool, this is what a one you know, I don't have a I don't have an eleven through twenty because well, anyway, it's the way I number things. But um yeah, here you can see it's like cool, like I have twenty lights, here's what a mirror out with you know, mirror out with a mirror out three interleave is gonna look like. It's divided into three parts. Uh, and it's mirroring it all out together. And I can see that before I do anything, before I run anything on it. Which is kind of nice. Very all good. right. Well, Yay. well we've got, uh, we're Trusty. out of time after, so you know, let's, let's go until we're done, and then we'll sit around and answer questions. Time Yay, for suppressing. Yes, yeah, time for the new stuff. Break mode. Woo! -hoo! So break mode's kind of like this like twilight zone of where an effect is the effect that you know, but it's also not the effect that you know. Um, it's, they're based on absolute effects. Uh, they work from, it's an absolute effect modifier, but it changes the nature of that effect. Um, so it's definitely worth taking a moment uh, on talking about. Uh, when, you know, basically the definition of it, right, when each of the channels is greater than the number of steps in the effect, each channel will cycle through each step and then wait in the last action until the last channel enters the last selection. All right, moving on. I think we all got that. Um, let's move on to variables. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> what, the, what the heck does that mean? All right, so let's go, in, let's go back into our 
EOS here, and let's take a look at what that means. Well, I'm going to uh, go ahead and I'm going to create a new effect. I create effect seven here, get an absolute effect. And in my attributes, right, I have a modifier that says break mode. So that is going to turn a break mode, this absolute effect, into a break mode effect. So I've gone ahead and I've made this break mode. And I want to run this at a level of, uh, let's do 100 over a background state. Let's do 0, 1, 0, 1 again so we can see it. Awesome. So our favorite effect again. We know how this would run if it wasn't a break mode, right? It would evenly distribute and run along all the channels. Let's grab all these X-bar cells again. And let's run this new break mode effect. Uh, do, do, do. Actually, change this to zero so we can see it. There's a good reason why it's doing that. But right, and we see one lonely pixel crawl along the lights. Why is that? Well, because the way that break mode works, right? Uh, break mode. Did, you, oops, did I miss? I miss my. Ah, I missed my slide. There it is. Right. I often, if if we think about effects as um, typically, we think of channels. We think of the effects, the actions being divided across channels, right? So the, act, the effect is running across the channels. When I think of a break mode effect, I think of the channels running across the effect. So in this case, what's happening is the channels are coming into the effect and is going through each action one at a time. And then it, then it waits in that last action until all the channels have gone through and then it goes back to the top. So if we go back to our EOS augmented thing here, we can see that lonely pixel is still crawling along here. Because, and why is that? Well, because we have, right now we have a level of 100. So the first, the first pixel is going to this level of 100, and then it moves on to the next channel, and then we wait in this bottom action. We wait in this action of zero. So uh, let's go ahead and let's do this with a, like a color effect. So we're, and this is one place where break mode can really shine is in like bands of color and stuff like that. So I'm going to stop this effect and I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and I'm actually going to edit this effect. And instead of 100, I'm going to go ahead and make, uh, let's go ahead and let's make a, uh, let's make a rainbow effect, right? So first thing I want to do is, uh, well, actually let's do it wrong and then we'll do it right. How's that? And so then we'll make this orange, we'll make this yellow, we'll make this green, we'll make this cyan, we'll make this blue, and lavender, and magenta. Okay. We'll come back into live, and let's make all of these cells, and we're going to make them white. And we're going to run this effect. Well, they, okay, they snapped to magenta, and now we're running this color band. It's kind of uh, it's kind of hard to see on this little window. Let me take it a little bigger here so we can see it. Um, uh, we're running this color band, and we're running it over magenta. Well, why the heck are we running it over magenta where it's, we, we had it over white? Well, right, the reason is because, let's do, remember, we are waiting in this last step here. We're waiting in this magenta step. Why did it automatically snap to magenta? Well, because our entry is set to immediate. Right? If we'd sent this entry to cascade, you see it's going to start in white, which is its background state, and then as it crawls along, it's going to leave this tail of magenta because it just waits in this background state. Right, so let's play with this a little more. So first thing that we want to do is, you know what, rather than, I want to add a step here at the end. I want to add, I want this to run over my background state. So I'm going to add a step here, or an action. That's my background state. And now we can see we have this rainbow effect running over this background state. Okay. It's getting better, um, but uh, the white is so bright, it's really hard to see our color, right? Well, let's go ahead and let's grab all of these pixels. And let's make them 50%. Oops. That's as I'm doing like 17 things at once, all right? Well, now our, now our rainbow is really hard to see because it's dimmed down with it. Oh, well, we want this to, Come up to full as we run it. So I'm going to go into my effect. Well, so I'm going to come in here and I'm going to make my first step here. I'm going to insert a step, right? And if you didn't know you could do this, right? You know there's an insert before soft key. Helpful to know. And I'm going to make this 
100%. I'm going to need to rerun this because this effect currently doesn't know that it's supposed to run on uh, intensity as well. So I'm going to come in here and stop this effect. I'm going to reselect these cells. I'm going to run this effect. Uh, run the effect. Thank you very much. And now I'm running it. But if we look at it, it's still kind of weird. Oops. As I'm, right? it's, I kind of got this like bright white square at the beginning. And why is that? Well, because remember, this here, right? this counts as one of our pixels. So it's doing this action, bring it to 100. And then it's going red, orange, green. So we actually, we're going to do a little bit of modification. So one thing I always do is I'm always going to put a background state as the first state in my um, break mode effect. The reason being is because this first step, this first action, defines the length of a pixel for, for no better, for without like a better term. Um, so right now, because really I don't want to see this come to 100. I just want it to come to 100 at the same time it goes to red. But if I give this a dwell of zero, it's going to wig out. Because it's like, ah, this first step needs something. This isn't going to work. So I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to insert another action. Insert him. I'm going to make this. Save. David, can you show us your, uh, your effects? Yep. I just wanted Display to. Too. Thanks. Yeah. Camera switching and doing it at the same time. Seems like a good idea. Um, so sometimes with break mode effects, you need to kind of stop them and rerun them especially when it's kind of a dramatic change like that. So now we are actually seeing that we are getting this, and I'm just going to make A3D big for a second here. Right? We don't have that white bar anymore. Why don't we have that white bar anymore? Well, because I have this background state. Right? This background state obviously doesn't show up. And now my, my intensity of 100 here doesn't have any timing. So it happens, and then we instantly go into this red. So now we've made this, we've made this full. So what we're doing is we're basically defining, um, we're defining each one of these pixels. Now what's cool is this first, pic this first step here defines the length of our pixel. So right now this first step is one second. If I want to make each one of these bars bigger, I can go ahead and I can make, say I want to make red three times as big. I'm going to give it a dwell of three seconds. It's going to restart, but now you're going to see it's actually three pixels worth of red because it is three times the length of my first action here. So if I wanted to make this a long rainbow, I can do five, 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 five. And then as I run it, let me speed it up a little bit, uh, 20 seconds, 10 seconds. Right. Now I've got these longer bands of color that are running along this. And it comes to full, it runs, and then at the end it reverts to its background state. Um, again, remember if I remove that last background state, uh, we're, you know, we're going to stay in whatever our last action is. Uh, and now I can use, I can still use my grouping and my trail and my offset and all this stuff um, to help, right? So I can say if I make this grouping of 20, right? and now it's doing it on every bar because it's still running this effect. It's just basically recycling it every 20 lights or every 20 pixels. Grouping of 50, it's going to do it every 50 pixels, grouping of 100. We can get this sweep, go left to right. And then, of course, we can combine this with offset. So let's go back. We'll go back into, let's reset this to spread here. And we're yeah, I just live. Some, I just yeah. want to put some clarification in here before we move on too far. Um, you know, it's important to remember that in, in absolute effects, um, those steps are, are uh, LTP, right, latest take precedence, which means that as you're going through them, for example, uh, David, step two uh, talks to the intensity, right? Um, and so once the intensity is turned on, the, the following steps don't talk to intensity, right? They're color palettes, they're talking just color parameters. So that intensity stays on until it's talked to again, which is in step 11 when it says, go back to your background state. So, you know, conceptually, I think this is really important. Um, that as you add steps in uh, absolute effects, if you're talking to different parameters and different steps, um, they're going to remain at their last position um, until they're talked to again, right? Um, so just be aware that if you're doing something like this, the reason this is working for David is because uh, it hits uh, step two, turns the fixtures to full, then starts adjusting their color, then resets everything back to the background to let the, the trail of this effect 
um, uh, go back to its background intensity. Um, so just be aware and use that to your advantage. Right, because actually if I, if I came in here and I deleted this last step, right, what's actually going to happen, let me just go big for a second, we can see it, it's going to go full and then the lights are going to just stay at full because that's the last, uh, well, actually that's not true because I've, I've got the background step as the first step. Um, but you can see it's staying in this magenta. It's stay, yeah, it's staying in magenta at full. Why is it staying in magenta at full? Because that's the last place it was told to be. It was never told to go back to its background state. Um, yeah. And then when it recycles through all the lights, they'll snap to their background state, or they'll fade in this case because there's timing associated with it. There's 0.24 second timing. Um, but that's why we see this purple and full basically remaining. It's because I haven't told it. I haven't told intensity to do anything else. Exactly. And, and Mark asked a good question about why do we have to have um, the background as the first step if the background is the last step. Um, and, and really that has to do with the fact that um, it, the first time you run this effect, right, it's first way through all of the channels. If you didn't have background as that first step, you're going to get that white dot. The second time that white dot would go away because then it would have passed to that step 11, that background step. Um, but it's making sure that you're cleaning up that first path of the effect before it can loop all the way through it. Um, and, and to be to be honest with you, we probably wouldn't we wouldn't need this background if we didn't have this intensity, right? Because we were just cool, it just change the color to red and we would go. But because we're dealing with this dual thing, it's gonna this you know this intensity and this color change is the reason we needed this background. So I could I could actually delete this step, right? And let's delete this step as well. Right now, you see, cool, I don't actually, I'm sorry, I realized you weren't seeing what I was doing. I apologize for that. Um, but now you can see that, okay, it, we don't get that white dot, right? We just see the colors chasing through. If I wanted those colors to come back, let me insert this step. And this is just illustrating again what Nick was talking about. Okay, cool, let me make this 100 because I want, oops. David said if I, I can make this change color and chase intensity, that's awesome. Do that change this to zero, one, I get that white dot because it, this first step counts, this first action counts, and it needs a timing value because it's defining the, the, the proportional timing values of all the actions after it. So, in order, so how do we make this white dot go away, like Nick was saying, is we give this a timing of zero. Well, we give this a if we give this a dwell of zero, the effect doesn't like it because that first step needs, the first step needs an action. So that's where you kind of stumble into making this a background state. You don't need to rerun the effect. But. And now you'll see that white dot has gone away, but these lights are going to fall. If that a couple further illustrates. Before we, before we leave it, um, Andrew asks, so how is the break mode assisting with this rainbow since the first and last steps are background? Awesome. The most interesting, well, because if we wanted this pixel, right, we want this rainbow to chase as a series of pixels in this case, right? So let's make this a little bigger so we can see all these. Right, so we've got, cycle time, 20. Right, we've got this, this rainbow going on here. If I just take this out of break mode, We're going to evenly distribute this just like a regular effect, right? So now we have the effect running across the lights, right? Because we have a grouping of spread and we have an even trail. So this is how we would expect an absolute effect to run in this manner. We see a, we, we take the total number of actions, divide them by the total number of lights, and we have this run. And we can see those colors and we can actually see the background state in there as well. It's that like kind of gray bar in there. If I want just a pixel chase, turning on break mode is going to run the channels through the effect, right? And that's what's going to give us this color chase. Yeah, and I think while you're kind of describing that, uh, can you also show break mode versus a trail solo? Because a, a trail solo will also get you a very different look than a break. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you know, I, I think we should just show what that does differently, because they, they are different behaviors. Yeah, so well, trail solo, right, each, let me make this bigger because it's so small, but uh, actually, make it, make it a grouping of like, um, 
right? So we can see it in a couple of places. Each lonely pixel is making its journey through the effect because it's doing it by itself. It's solo. So it's, it's going to run, each pixel is going to run through the entire effect. And I can change this trail to, change this trail to 1% here. And it's similar, but it's still running across all of the channel selection, right? So they are, they are different beasts because the solo is going to be each pixel, make your journey through the effect. Break mode is this effect run across the channel selection uh, in this order um, with this, you know, kind of as a, as a single package, so to speak. Yeah, and I, you know, I think one of the things that, that is key that's different than anything else is that it is once a pixel or a channel has run its whole portion of the effect, it sits in the last step until all the channels have started that effect, right? Again, in, in sort of David's very academic uh, description at the very beginning of this, that's what's really different, right? And so, you know, there was a, a show um, that I worked on last October where we were doing a comet through space over a pixel map. Um, the previous programmer that had worked on the show had to do a lot of really crazy stuff to get those comets to sort of behave properly. What we were able to do when we were reprogramming some stuff in break mode is put in uh, an amber head, a couple of different steps of, of different color palettes going down to purple, and then the last step was black, and we just left those pixels um, in black so that as the comet ran, um, it, it only uh, it, it only had to to run it once, um, and everything would go so black out. Um, so, so uh, play with break mode. I think that again, it's one of those things that's subtle, but this is something that has been asked for for a long time, um, and it really helps um, solve some issues that that we weren't able to easily solve without a lot of overhead in, in previous applications. Um, so, yeah, that's yeah, that's kind of the you know kind of what Nick was talking about, right? We have a it goes red, you know, red, red, orange lavender, whatever, 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 right? And I can say, oh, cool, you know, I could use the timing and I can also just say, oh, I want, you know, I want another red pixel. Cool, let me just insert another red pixel. And now there's four red pixels, two orange pixels, a blue pixel, a lavender, a magenta, and a black pixel. Yep. And I'm able to run that, you know, in every uh, one of these lights, so to speak. We've got one more question in this area, and then I promise to stop pulling you off track. Um, no, nah, it's all good. Uh, just really quickly, do you want to talk about uh, single shot or two shot effects with break mode? Um, I don't think there's anything that's um, specific about yeah, it. Yeah, sure. I mean, so you know, we can number of cycles, right? So we make a number of cycle one, um, and we want to. Cascade our exit there. Second time. Get it faster so we can see it. Oh, I'm doing the different effect here. But, um, you know, it's just going to, I mean, I, I don't know exactly what you want me to talk about. Um, it's going to, you know, it's going to run it, and then it's going gonna, gonna to run it, it's going to stop. Um, you know, but here you can see it's interesting, right? Because as we go through this, right, we have all these pixels that are on and white. And remember, we're trailing with this black. And then to do number of cool, yeah, pixels. Oh, interesting. What am I supposed to be showing? That's the question, Nick. Um, yeah, I'm, I think I'm not. Yeah, I'm not necessarily. Ex I was actually not necessarily expecting it to loop like it's looping. To be honest with you, um, I think I think it might have to be rerun. Well, yeah, you're, not, you're right. That's that is the thing with break mode. Um, I always forget to do. You're like, oh, it's kind of working. And it's like, nope, uh, it's got to be rerun because you're right. It wasn't picking up that first yeah. that first fixture anyway. Um, so we're watching it. We're watching it. It's going. Go faster. All right, and then, interesting. 
Don't know. Oh, I'd have to play. I'd have to play with that. I'd have to play with that because I don't know. To be honest with you, I'm not sure I've ever done a single shot break mode effect. Congratulations. Yeah, we might have got, got me a bug here. Congratulations, yeah. you got me. Yeah, I um, think you know it's supposed to do a, a single run. It's and supposed to do it once. Be yeah. Done. So um, see if. Uh, yeah, so stop and hold will do it, um, right? So I had to change my, which, I mean, it should do it on fade by size and fade by rate too because of the nature of the way that break mode works. Um, but, the, you know, I got it to do a single, because of the stop and hold, right? And stop and hold, if we do want that single shot effect, a lot of times that's what we want anyway, right? Because we want it to end in that last action. Um, so, yeah, for this case, the, you know, entry of cascade, exit of cascade, and stop and hold, hold got it to work. Yeah, I don't know why fade by size didn't work. I'll have to dig into that a little later. Um, and I will be seeing some of you on the beta forums, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, good question. Uh, we'll, we'll look into that and, and try and get to the bottom of that. But yeah, we, we all expect it to, to do a single shot when you say do a single shot. So we'll look into that. Yes. Uh, and the other thing we can do real quick with break mode um, before we move on, because I know that we are starting to hemorrhage time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, are, we, are at, we, are, we are at time. You know what? I'm going to not do another break mode example, and we're going to very quickly talk about variables. Um, yeah, and keep in mind, just you know, point of order real quick, um, we've got about a half an hour left of, of real time. We'll get through the new stuff that David's covering, um, and then if there are other examples that you want to see, if there's more questions that you have, we'll stick around um, and, and answer a few more questions. Uh, and if you want to get off to HOG, um, then we can let you go uh, without missing any information. Uh, all you, David, thank you. Cool. So effect variables. This is new in 3.0. It is probably the single thing I am the most excited about, um, as anyone who is an avid reader of the forums probably knows. Um, so right up until now, we've had these effects and they've contained this hard-coded data, right? So we've had, sure, the, you know, we've had, oh, cool, we can go between 100 and we can go between zero. Yeah, okay, I can make it a color palette. I can make it some other sort of reference data, but there is always a value in there that is associated with the effect at some level. What variables allow us to do is variables allow us to take that same effect, but in that line, right? Instead of having a hard-coded value, we can put a variable. And what this means is that we can, at runtime, set what this variable's value is, and then store that in anything that can take that sort of information. So this becomes really powerful for making effects that are portable, um, that are easily transferable from show to show, that, you know, great for busking ap applications, uh, all that sort of stuff too, because I can, just, I can kind of shape the, the feel of the effect, but leave the content of the effect until I run it. Uh, cool, so let's go back in here. So first thing I'm going to do is let's create a new effect. Um, um, create effect. And, yeah. So. We're still seeing your PowerPoint. You are? Should not be. Really? Okay. I I'm not Nick. Maybe you're frozen. I might be frozen. Oh. I mean, I'm the first person to admit it's probably me. But. Um, all right, so I'm going to create a two-step effect here, just like we've been dealing with this whole class, except instead of a hard value here, I'm going to actually come down here, and in the uh, soft key one is variable. I'm going to go ahead and type variable one. Now I get var one as step. Let's go back into live. Let's go ahead and let's apply this to, well, let's say let's apply it to those, those top mythos here. We'll put them up. Great, awesome. Let's run this effect. And nothing happens. Well, we can see the effect is applied. Why has nothing happened? Well, because variable one, this is variable one over a background state. Variable one is currently undefined. Uh, when the variable is undefined, and intensity variable is undefined, it's going to manifest as zero. How do I define that? Well, if I come into my ESD and I click on attributes, I see here that I now have an option for variable one. Go ahead and tap on variable one, and if I make this 100, I'm now running a hundred, a, a chase that is 100 over zero, because that is, you know, basically the definition of my variable. I can come in here and I can change this, or I can change this variable to 
75, and now I'm running HAs of 75 over 0. Come back into my effect. We actually change level 2. We'll make this the variable 2. And go back into live. Now, a variable or a variable that is undefined is going to manifest as 0, so we are still running our 75 over 0 chase. But if I open my ESD and I come here and I define variable 2 as, say, 25, right, I am now running a chase that is 75, 75 over 25. Um, so this is a totally new way to do kind of high-low effects. Um, say, oh, cool, I want this chase, and I want the high to be 75, and I want the low to be 25. Oh, no, 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 you want make the low 35. And I've made the low 35, and I haven't had to go into the effect and change it to the effect level. And this is something, uh, getting back to the question earlier about how do you organize and how do you, how do you store these, this is kind of changing that, that dynamic for me a little bit. Um, and this is something I'm asked to do a lot. Uh, make, that, make that high 85, make the low 17. And I can do that here at the effect, at the channel, at the, uh, the queue level and store that locally at the queue level without changing the base effect. And it's also faster for me than going in to the effect and changing all of that. Uh, I can also change, uh, I can also provide these default levels, right? So let's say, okay, I've got this effect, I like it, um, but I want to make this a little more flexible. Let me come into effect here, and I'm going to set my time set this to variable three. Um, I'm just going to both the variable three. And so I now have this effect, and it's not going to play back at all, right, because it doesn't have any timing variables. So I know that when I want to apply this, I want something to show up on stage. I don't want to be just like nothing happens. So I can actually come into my attributes, and I can say, you know what, variable three, you should have a default of one. You should have a default of zero seconds. And you can see how that changed. So now, when I'm in live, right, I am running this chase, and it is running with a time of zero as defined by the variable that is set in the effect, and a dwell of one, which is set in the effect. If I want to make this smoother, I want it to have a fade, I can just come into my effect here, select variable three, give it, a, give it one, and now I'm, I have a fading, right? I'm fading up in one second, holding one second, and then fading to the next action in one second. And then I can store this uh, in queues and presets and subs. So, because this is just, right, it's red data, it's red ESD data. Anywhere I can record ESD data, uh, I can record this. I mean, I actually don't want Q1 anymore, so let's get rid of that. I'm going to record this as Q1. And now we can see in my ESD, I've got all of this stored as Q level data. Uh, I can also apply this, so I can write effects that are completely variable based, and then use those, define those variables when I call them up. Um, so if I have like flicker effects that I always like, or my step ramp burst and sine wave effects that I use all the time, I can have those variable based and then just define, well, what are my high lows? What are exactly are my timing values when I, when I, um, when I bring them in uh, to the show? So let's, we can also use color palettes and presets. So I'm gonna come back into my effect. I'm gonna make an effect 10 gotten totally lazy about labeling these. Do as I say, not as I do, everybody. Um, let's say I want this to be a color palette chase. I want this to be a color over a background state. So what I'm going to do is I have level, color palette, variable, one, enter. Um, we need to define this, the, that we want it to be a color palette at the time of creation, because all a variable does is store a number. So it doesn't store a target at all. So if we just say variable one, it's going to be looking for intensity. If we want it to look for a color palette, we need to define that this is looking for a color palette number. The other thing we need to do with, when using reference data is we need to provide a default value. For intensity, we don't need to provide a default value, and it will assume a value of zero. There's no, there's no preset or palette zero. It doesn't mean anything. So we have to make sure that we define this in the effect. Also notice I have variable one here. Each variable is per effect. So I have variable, I can have variable one for each one of my effects. Um, so I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna make this one. One is my no color, my no color palette. I'm gonna come in live here. And now I'm gonna take my handy dandy uh, X bars here. I'm gonna take them, I'm gonna run this effect. And now I'm running this, uh, this white over the kind of default purple effect, the gross default purple effect. 
you know what, let's go ahead and let's come in a, let's grab that effect and I want to change variable one and I want it to be a red over per, you know red over background state effect well red is my color palette too I'm gonna oops, type on tap on variable two and now I have red running over background state I want this to be cyan six right? and I can still have all of my other tools variable so I'm gonna come here I'm gonna make this a color palette the color palette variable two define color variable two here as one as well so that if I just apply this effect it right off the bat well, I've already already had those variables defined but um, variable two I want a cyan over red chase I'm going to say variable two you be red Oops, can't tap on the screen yet they fixed that though in the latest beta build which is exciting um, so now I have a cyan over red effect and none of that's hard coded at the effect level that's all defined um, at runtime so you can really I mean for me this gets me really excited because as someone who has a stock pool of effects that I'm bringing in, I never know what I'm gonna be walking into I can very quickly apply these shapes if you will of effects or these these, these fields of effects that I like um, and then change them on the fly and then store that at the queue level um, I can also right apply this to other other parameters so let's go ahead and let's create one more effect I'm going to create an absolute effect here and we're going to do this as um, variable one actually you know what let's make a um, make a what do you think? let's make a flyout effect real quick I think that'll be that'll be fun right everyone who's everyone watched my videos they know they know how to do this so I'm not going to walk us through this um, all right, we want to start in the background state then what we want to do well we want to turn the light on 100 and what we want to do well we want to tilt it up how long do we want it to tilt up well we want it to take about a second to tilt up um, eh, we'll have it go to plus 100 right at plus 100 at plus 100 at, at plus 100 thank you then we want you to turn off and then I want you, actually I want you to fade off. And then we want you to reset to your background state. Awesome. And you know what though? This remember this line here, the fly out. So this line is actually going to be tilt. I always like to do that last, otherwise every new line will be tilt. So we've got that fly out effect. I'm gonna grab these mythos. I'm gonna run it. Awesome, we've got this fly out effect. Tilt it down a little bit, so. Well, right now it's going up 100. Well, I want to bring this with me. I don't know the size of the theater. I don't know what pipe this is applying to. I don't, you know, there's a lot of things I don't know this about this. Well, I can actually come into this effect. And instead of plus 100, I'm going to make this variable one. Right? Well, now they don't do anything because variable one is undefined. But now I can come in here and I say, okay, effect. Let's make you 50. You're smaller. Make you 200. Oops. You're bigger. And what's cool is that this is macroable, right? So I can write macros. Like here I have two macros, and I can type variable 150, and it's going to change it to 50. Variable 1, 100, and it's going to make it bigger. So I can start to define, you know, have macros that define these variables. Um, and what I'm doing here, by the way, is if we look at this macro, we're interested in looking at macros at all. Interested in looking at macros. Um, shove it over to a tab that's not locked there you go macro macro you go over here right all it says is affect variable one and the level and that will apply to the last applied effect so that's what I use for hey apply this effect slow it down um, and I'll just I can have these and this will apply to the last applied effect you can also have this target specific effects in the ESD um, so variables are just like, you know, they're, they're very exciting. They're very exciting because they allow us to build these really portable package effects that we can move from one to the other. And I think, um, you know, I think as, as they mature and they, you know, as they mature and we continue to define what they are, um, they're only gonna, they're only gonna get better. Um, we can store these, by the way, again, we can store this in queues, we can store uh, presets, we'll remember. 
uh, ESD information, so you could store this with variable information in presets, and uh, you can store it in submasters, uh, and then you can recall it from there. Uh, that you know, the nice thing about variables is really not actually that much to talk about them. You set them, you you know, you define in effect where you want that variable to be. Um, we can define a default variable, right, if we want, and then we define it at runtime, and then we record it, and that's that's all there is to it. Um, yeah, and that's that's kind of you know all the the prepared you know I think oh cool 15 minutes under time look at me go um, <laughs> we you know that's it's kind of the end of the I would call it the loosely prepared presentation for the day um, but yeah I mean if there's anything we want to talk about I'm happy to uh, I'm happy to tackle it at this time or yeah uh, yeah I coffee I figure well there's some a bunch of questions that came in sort of just discussing um, uh, variables in in general, and and mm -hmm. so I just I want to kind of explain more from a a ten thousand foot standpoint as as to what they are. So so variables um, first of all are not their own thing, right? Each effect can have um, its own variable one, variable two, variable three. We give you up to nine variables per effect, right? So um, if if you need to define more than that, um, at a certain point you need to actually Put stuff into a queue, or excuse me, into an effect, right? Um, if you need to do like a 30 color rainbow chase, you can still do that, right? You don't have to use variables for that. Variables are really for if I want a two color chase or a color over my background, now I don't have to have an effect for every color. I can have one effect that allows me to pick different variables. So don't think about them as, um, you know, you wouldn't put a, a variable in every single step for a really complicated effect, you'd still build an effect, right? Um, and, and define each of those things in the effect. Um, because of that, uh, because variables sort of aren't their own thing right now, at least in 3.0, um, you can't label a variable, right? So there's no way to say, when I see variable one show up, I want to call it uh, high. And when I see variable two show up, I want to call it low. Um, that's been requested. We're going to have to see with how it's implemented and how people use it after 3.0, um, what that does. But, but that also serves the point that variables aren't global, right? Variable one doesn't exist everywhere when I define it. Um, effect one, variable one is, is completely different than effect one, variable two. Um, that's also why we make you define it if you're, you're dealing with something like color palettes, right? We want to know um, what parameters you're going to need to be controlling. Um, so, you know, play with them, see how you do. Um, but I, I think that these are, uh, really just for these, these effects where it's like, I want to do a color chase over a background, uh, or I want to do a two color chase or something like that. Now I don't have to have, if I have seven colors, I don't have to have 49 effects to do each color, um, for a two color chase. I can have one effect and pick those on the fly. Um, some other questions that I saw come in. Uh, where can you use direct selects to define variables? Um, that's currently broken, but, but that's intended to work, I believe. Um, so, yeah. so I, I think that that will make it faster, right? That's cool. Um, and variables get changed uh, in your uh, in your queue level override in your effect status display, right? Um, like David said, you can define what the default of the variable is in the effect editor. So, which is really nice, right? If you think most of the time you're going to need uh, the color to be cyan, and then you want to be able to override it every once in a while, um, you can define that. Uh, but all these changes, how you define the variable, um, gets done in the effect status override, right? In the queue level override. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, obviously, this is a new feature for us. Um, as you have feedback, as, as things go, go to the forums. Um, let us know what you think and, and how we can improve it. Um, but but I think it's a, a pretty powerful thing for for what it does for right now. Um, yeah, I mean I think you know kind of just to Nick's point about you know like you know here I'm using one very you know like you know everyone carries around a they've come into vogue right chasing rainbow effects they're back um, for whatever reason. Um, Everyone loves a good chasing rainbow, right? So I'm going to carry this with me, but do I want a hard edge chasing rainbow? Like, do I want it to fade? Do I want it to be steppy? You know, I, do I want to carry three or four chasing rainbow effects? Not necessarily. So I'll create one, and here's cool. All the time vari values are variable one. All the dwell values are value variable two. And then I can just 
decide at runtime whether or not I want this to be a hard-edged effect or I want it to be a soft-edged effect, you know, and it's just one effect, and I'm not using a variable for every single action in the effect. I'm just using it for time, but it allows me to have one thing that I bring around instead of four or five things that I bring around, or have to make, make copies of and all that sort of stuff. Um, cool. So uh, I've got some other questions that are coming in. Um, uh, just to touch, retouch on John's question, where can you see what level each variable is once it's defined? Again, that's in the effects status display. With a clear command line, if you hit effect, it will pop that up in your CIA. But don't forget that you can also open that a tab, right? So effects status display in another window can be really useful if you're using this sort of stuff um, pretty regularly. Um, so, so that's good. Um, I actually haven't played with this um, and, and don't know the exact answer to this. David, maybe you've played. Um, do, do variables function uh, when you record the effect into uh, Submaster? Um, the, that... vari the variable is stored at the the variable is stored in the submaster. Yeah. So if we were to take this, right, and we were to record this as uh, sub whatever, sub one, and then let's do. Oh, I have like this weird thing. Got to get my uh, tabs in order here. Tabs, yeah, great. And then I was to bring sub one up, right? And I look in the ESD. It's you know this is coming out of the. Um, you know, the, the submaster will record that variable information. You can see I'm bringing the sub up and down, and it, it's it's putting the attributes, the variable attributes, down there in the bottom. Um, so yeah, any place you can record ESD information, it will store variable information. Excellent. Thank you. Cool. Um, uh, are there any other? We've got a lot of questions coming in that are sort of off the stuff we've discussed. Um, so we'll get to those in a little bit. Uh, I, I saw a couple of them that we just haven't answered. Um, uh, if there are any other questions on stuff we've talked about, we've got about eight minutes. Um, so feel free to uh, type in. Uh, those of you who asked uh, questions kind of on other topics, uh, we'll hang around in a couple minutes and get to those. Um, so while we are kind of waiting for the last few questions to come in, um, uh, I just want to thank David for putting this together. This has been fabulous. Um, you know, his, his video production work alone has been significantly better than any of the things that we've put together. So I appreciate all your work on that. Um, and uh, and yeah, uh, don't forget that uh, obviously the forums are where you can put your requests and bug issues. If you're dealing in 3.0, use the 3.0 forum. Uh, Rob and I uh, are happy to take emails and answer your questions uh, when we can. Um, and uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for spending your time with us. And, and if you're heading over to Hog, tell everybody over there we said hello. So um, Stefan asks if we can set variables uh, on a fader with a minimum and maximum. Uh, no, right? So variables are. are Again, each effect has its own variable. Um, so right now, we're defining that in the, uh, in the Q level override or in the sub override. Um, that might be something that we would explore in the future, depending on how we see people using them. Um, but currently, that is just something that you would set and record into your Q or your sub. Um, that isn't something that uh, the variable isn't, isn't variable right now. Um, so thanks for that. Um, uh, Martin asks if you can do math on variables. Um, example variable one at plus ten percent. Um, not to my knowledge, not currently. You uh, that's the point of using a variable, right? If, if you wanted something different, you would just put in that number. So if you had fifty percent stored in the effect. Um, as the default variable, and you wanted it to be 60%, you use the variable to add 60%. So um, if there's something that I'm missing, let me know. But the point of variable I mean, is that it allows you to add and subtract stuff on a one-off basis. What do you think, David? I mean, I, 
I think you should be able to do math on variables. Um, okay. There, there are a number of there are going to be a number of things that are, are popping up on certain forums um, when I when I get the time, particularly about variables. I think you should be able to do math on variables. Um, I won't be surprised. You know, I don't know. I'd like to see us eventually get there. Uh, I could see the appeal of being able to have variable one, variable two, and then say variable, you know, uh, have a level be variable one slash 50, variable two, uh, you know, slash plus 25, you know, like slash 200, um, and then be able to set a high and low and then have proportional values in between there. I can see the value in that. Um, it's not currently something that is supported, but also still in beta. <laughs> Yeah, and, and new feature, you know, a lot like um, we, we it's yep. kind of a little bit of how the sausage is made. Um, we are always very cautious when we introduce new uh, new things into the market. It's very easy to, to say, we're going to take this one thing and think of everything everybody could possibly do to it. Um, and, and what you get is maybe a feature that doesn't serve a lot of people well. Um, so what we try and do is, is especially with features like this, put it out there, let people get used to it, let people understand how it fits in with the rest of the tools that already exist, um, and then sort of assess uh, how that feature might grow or change. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a intentionally holding back some of the ideas that everybody's having um, to make sure the feature makes sense and is, is implemented and, and doesn't feel like it's too complex for what we're trying to have it do. So um, again, as you use it, as you play with it, um, when everybody's back in production and applying these things in a, in a, real, uh, a real show, um, I'm very interested to hear uh, how these things help you or hinder you. And, and uh, you know, 3.1, 3.2, uh, we'll make improvements and uh, go from there. So uh, just to recap, Owen asks if there's a limit to the number of variables you can use. It's nine per effect. Um, I am unaware of any limitation globally um, because we're defining each variable in each effect. Um, I don't think the console cares if you're running, you know, 16 effects and you have six variables in each of them. Um, I'll, I'll verify that with, with R&D, but I, I'm pretty sure that because we've compartmentalized those two effects, um, they're not global, but we don't really have any uh, limit to that stuff. So good question there. Um, what are some, do you have any other thoughts on using um, variables in, in the time column, David? In the what column? Time uh, column? Using a variable as uh, in timing. You're I mean, I think, uh, I, 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 you know, I think there's value in being able to have, you know, especially in a two-step effect, right, you can theoretically have a effect where, um, you know, each one of these is a variable, right? Variable one, variable two, variable three. And then, you know, it's like, cool, like, what do you want it to be? Do you want it to just be a square wave? Do you want it to be a burst? Do you want it to be a sine wave? Do you want it to be, and you can change that on the fly depending on how the combination of variables that you use. Um, and then, you know, that's macroable. So you could say, cool, have a, you know, make it a, make, apply this one effect and have variable one and variable three be one and variable two and variable four be zero and you've just made a sine wave sawtooth effect. Do the other way and you have a square wave effect. Um, you know, there, there's value to that. Um, you know, especially I could definitely see in the dwell column too of like, oh, make, put in more black space, put in less black space, um, make the distance between these bursts longer or shorter. Um, Strobe duration, you know, I had a whole strobe thing we didn't really get into, but, you know, the black, the, the amount of space between a random flicker effect or a random strobe effect, um, all that I think is worthwhile for having in there. Yeah, it, it sort of takes the effects level, the, the Q level override stuff that we've been doing and kind of takes it to the next, the next level. Um, uh, a couple of people have asked about sort of what the relationship is between variable timing um, in you know, when you use variable timing and what that does in cycle time. I, I think this is great. Right now, you'll notice David's screen, cycle time now says variable. So as soon as you use a variable in timing, um, you know, the board doesn't know the, the cycle time, right? Cycle time has the ability to change based on the sum of all those variables. 
Um, so we indicate that. We say that cycle time is variable. Um, and depending on uh, what you set those variables to, uh, that will adjust the cycle time. Um, so, so keep that in mind. Um, another question, any future consideration for global variables? Um, you know, I, I think, again, sure. I think we, we will certainly consider it. Um, I think we're going to see how people apply this um, and, and where people take it uh, before we sort of decide, you know, what some of the next steps are. Um, but, but again, if you, feel, if you feel a certain way, you know, you're using it in a certain manner, um, post that feedback and, and we'll consider that for future development. So good questions. Um, let's see, why don't we ask a non-variable question? We're over time, so if you have to go, thanks for joining. Um, otherwise, uh, we'll keep punching through some of these. Uh, let's see. It's coffee o'clock here. So. You, coffee you browse, I'm getting more coffee here. Very good. Yeah, I think um, uh, going back a little way, um, there's a couple of questions. Uh, Campbell asks if there's a way to put rate on a fader. Um, absolutely, and uh, you can do global rates. You can do rates for um, individual pieces of content. Um, we cover that in the fader control section of our level four video. So um, it looks like David's going to show you a quick example here. But you can filter to channels. You can filter to all sorts of stuff. Um, but if you want to learn a really comprehensive way to do that, check out our level four videos. Um, because we cover that in there as well. So thank you for that. No, now, uh, Nick, I'll answer that with a link. Yeah, oh, great, uh, perfect. In the, in the chat. Great, perfect. Um, just to recover, uh, uh, I would ask where you see uh, what the variables have been set to. That's in the effect status display, right? So keep an eye on there. Um, and again, those are just going to show you the effects that are currently running because variables are stored on a per target basis. So your variable one for the same effect may be defined as different values in two different queues. Um, so that's where it's going. Um, what else is coming in? Uh, very good. Uh, oh, Ryan asks, um, with linear effects, uh, is it possible to have different waveforms for different parameters in one effect? Um, Currently, David, do you want to talk about kind of how you deal with that? Because currently, we we don't really allow you to put different waveforms on different parameters in the same effect. Um, so well, you, can, you can, I mean, you can kind of do it in absolute effects, right? Like that's exactly what you know. That's exactly what a flyout effect is. I mean, it's not represented in a pretty graph, but you know, if we look at the flyout effect, right? We have, um, you know, we have a we have a intensity. And we have a tilt effect, right? So we have a ramp tilt effect, and we have a um, a basically a burst intensity overlaid on top of each other. Um, if you wanted to do it with physical waveforms like linear effects, you do it and you put it in a preset. But yeah, I mean, you can you can do it. I mean, you just have to think about the values. And in ways, I mean, in depending on what you're trying to do, in ways this is almost easier. Like I know it doesn't seem like it, but Sometimes it's hard to read multiple waveforms. I find it sometimes I find it harder to read multiple waveforms overlaid on top of each other than it is to just read lines in a table. It's his own. Yeah, and I guess that's that's kind of the thing is I think that you know when 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 I'm teaching effects classes at least in in um, the office or trade shows, you know I I I think one of the things that's uh, most difficult to really pick up on for the whole effects engine is not when do you use a specific type of effect, but when do you decide to, to, to bail on a specific type of effect, right? Something like I'm trying to get this waveform to work across multiple parameters, and you know, something like that. Oh, well, an, an absolute effect actually does that for you. Um, you know, knowing the effect engine well enough to know when to switch over to a different type of effect is, I think, a sign of, of having a really good grasp of the tools. Um, and, and I'll say this, you know, it's, we're, we're after time. So um, we don't always make it apparently clear either, right? There's, 
I think this effects engine is really, really powerful and it allows you to do a lot of new lot of stuff. Um, I think it also doesn't uh, always readily display what it's going to do. You have to know what each of those vocabulary words does. You have to know how all the dip switches add up to get a result. So I think for future development, we're looking to improve um, you know, what, what, we, what we kind of show you to give you an indicator of what effects are happening. Again, in 3.0, you saw that um, uh, offset is getting that little graph that just gives you a nod to like, hey, here's kind of what's going on. Um, we're brainstorming ideas that that could be useful in effects as well. Um, so stay with us, stay tuned. But um, yeah, it, it's, it, it can be sometimes too uh, difficult to internalize the whole engine when you're trying to focus on one task. And switching lanes can be a little tough sometimes. So, do you have any thoughts on that, David? No, I mean, I think you. I mean, I think you. I think you. You covered it. It's just you know that that's the hardest part, right? Is knowing when to use what tool for what job. Um, you know, I I use Absolute Effects ninety percent of the time, despite anyone who's you know, ironically enough, um, you know, the again we're after time, right? Um, the you know, the, the, anyone who's seen like the busking content that I've done, like it's a lot of linear effects. But honestly, most of my busking effects are absolute um, because, you know, I find they're more, they're more powerful in a lot of ways. Um, but they're less accessible to people from other platforms who may not be used to looking at a table and understanding what it means, right? So, um, you know, especially if you're coming from other platforms and you're comfortable you're, you're mainly comfortable looking at waveforms. Definitely the absolute effect can be hard to wrap your mind around, but I think once you understand the interplay of all the parameters and how they all work together, um, you can find just the ability to put proportional values and background states and not just you know proportional values, but increases in level beyond, like there's all sorts of cool stuff you can do in the table that you just, you just can't do in a linear effect, period. Um, but it's, yeah, it's when learning when to use those tools. Very good. Um, so, uh, oh, a question that's now come in twice. Hi, Michael. Um, uh, this is from your busking series. Oh, um, boy. <laughs> um, uh, what are your setup recommendations to take the take effects to the next level um, by creating macros or grouping? You know, how do you uh, how do you sort of decide what what groups you need to create when you come in on a rig, um, and how can macros help automate that? Um, oh, interesting. And 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 I think you know he's also asking a little bit about um, will each group of lights need separate duplicated effects if you're doing multiple cue lists? Um, you know, and I guess that has to do with like if you're adding or subtracting lights to effects that are already running. So yeah. I think these are two kind of two big separate questions. Yeah. So I'm gonna kind of answer the question, I guess. Um, the the long and the short of it is, and Nick, I know like you and I talked about it. And we talked about it with everyone who's involved in the busking video. Is you know that video series is great, and it's how to get up and running, and it's you know it's it is a great start. Uh, it's not my busking file does not look you know. It, it does not look like that. There, there. Are, I use a lot of those tools, but obviously, I there are a lot of macros. There's a lot of um, swapping that happens, uh, and that's you know that's how I end up doing it a lot. It's like, okay, cool. I can have you know multiple queues that have you know what I'll do a lot is I have multiple queues in a stack, let's say, that have multiple groupings of whatever fixtures they are associated with, um, the backlights, the spots, the what, whatever is on that. And Q1 will be every other, Q2 will be every third. And they're running the same effect, but it's stored in a stack. And then you can jump around in that stack, and that effect, as long as it's asserted, will apply differently to those groupings. Um, so, you know, I, I deal with it a lot on the playback side of just like getting that all set ahead of time. Um, if you're doing manual busking, like obviously, offset macros are a thing to have. I mean, I have a ton of them just for getting that stuff up and running quickly. Um, you know, offset every third, offset one of two, offset two of, you know, two of two, 
mirror out, mirror ins, randoms, having all that, if you're going to manually play it back, having that manually, and if, you're, if you are going to play it back off faders, you can store those, I mean, you can even actually put them in presets in the list if you want, and they'll remember that selection order, and they can use the same effect, but just have the selection order be different. So you could actually bump between those and have it go out, 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 and then you hit go, and it goes in, 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 and then you hit go again, and it goes every other, every other, and then you can tie that to other things that are triggering those cues to have that happen. There's, you know, you know the, the, the more versatile you are, the more complex it gets. Um, and the point of that series was it doesn't have to be complex. Um, you can do it without making it complex. But when you're like, okay, I want to deal with this specific light in this particular grouping, it's in this particular effect, with this particular timing, there are these other vectors that have to come in. And I think variables are going to play a part in that um, as, cool, I can change a variable and have that affect timing. There's a couple things that, a couple feature requests that I want to make that I think will make that a lot more um, busking friendly for the future. Um, and I think the variable space, even though it's not particularly dealing with grouping is a place where we can bring in another vector to make that really flexible. Yeah. Absolutely. Kind of dodged, but also kind of answered the question. So yeah, no, well, sorry. Count that as a win. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. Uh, uh, Steven uh, asks a, a question about busking. Um, uh, in your video, you talk about strobing lights with intensity effects. Uh, why do you do that instead of using something like a shutter strobe parameter for busking? Do you have a, a preference of intensity versus shutter strobe, or what sort of your yep. your thoughts there? Uh, I use intent. I mean, I use intensity effects. There's a couple reasons. Um, one is it's more transferable, right? Not every light has a shutter strobe, so I can have the strobe effect and I can apply it to everything because almost everything has intensity. Um, so that's really the first reason. Um, you know, it's easier to master on handles and stuff. Um, you know, I, I feel like in this, for most of what I've done, the intensity effects are fast enough. I've never, I've never been like, oh man, that the dowser in that moving light just isn't moving fast enough for that strobe. So a lot of times it's fine, especially when you're on camera, right? Like there's a limit to how fast you're going to go. Um, you know, shutter strobe effects in you know, in LED, especially in LED strobe lights, uh, you know, if I'm if they're traditional strobes, I'll use more of the the shutter strobe stuff because they they often interact weird with an intensity parameter because uh, there's a bunch of other stuff that needs to be on and and all that duration. But for LED strobe lights, there is no shutter strobe. It's just a parameter, but it's just affecting intensity. So I'm just going to cut out the middleman and just make it make it easier on myself, and then I can just have an intensity effect instead of one strobe for intensity, and then one strobe that does shutter strobe, and then one that actually varies the strobe rate. And I, then I need to make sure the strobe rates are in the right spot, depending on what I'm doing. It's like, cool, fast, you know, oh, this button strobes. Oh, now I have speed on a handle, as opposed to like, this button strobes, but it also sets those strobes in the right mode to do this thing that I want when I push this button, and then I want to slow that down. Okay, well, how is that set up? Maybe, you know, there's, there's a lot of other factors there, um, and I just find intensity the quickest and the easiest, and I don't know. I don't ever use shutter strobe parameters, really. I don't know. Maybe that makes me bad. But. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, there's no good bad here. I, but I, you know, it is an interesting thing. Like, especially with the way that you work, um, you know, going rig to rig, um, you know, trying to make trying to make your tools as portable as possible, regardless of the type of fixture you encounter. You know, I, I think those are considerations that are maybe different from someone who works in a theater that produces different shows, but generally has the same inventory. You know, so you, you might build things differently based on your applications. Um, you know, you never know which fixture you're going to encounter in the wild on any given day. Um, so you have to build something differently, and, and maybe you lock yourself out of some features that somebody else who sits on the same fixture every day uh, has, has more time and ability to explore. So. You know, I think it's just different different ways of working. Um, I mean, I love me, I love a good like random strobe parameter on a fixture. But you know, it's if you're like, oh, cool, I have this random strobe parameter on a fixture, and now I want to speed that random strobing up as the the song builds. Like you you can't really do that when every light in your rig is strobing, and half of them are doing it be intensity, and half of them are doing it be like the strobe random function. Like 
there's no good way that I found to manage that. Yeah, copy that. Um, I saw something about uh, some working stuff. Yeah. Um, so, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, but I think this is, is really good. You know, variables is really new. Um, obviously, there's not been a lot of production happening, so real world experience is maybe a little lacking. But where do you sort of feel about, um, you know, when, when you're busking live? Where do you think your workflow is going to go with um, multiple versions of a, of a similar or same effect um, versus using variables, um, both in regards to content and time? Like, what it, in the past, you've had to do various versions of multiple effects. Right. Where do you kind of see that changing with variables? It depends. Trying to think of how much I want to say here. Um, it depends on where the feature goes. There's there is a very particular place where I would like to see the variable feature go. Um, that is either well known or will become well known amongst those who have to listen to me talk about it. Um, whether or not the desk decides to go there is another question. And if it, you know, I think I think there's a. I'm excited about variables because I think it presents an opportunity for us to have cool i have this you know we're we're working on right now some of the things that we're working on that just got cleared up actually in the, the next coming build is transitions between variables and different queues and having to re having this restart effects or not having to restart effects and when all that happens and i think there's to me there's something really exciting about having one queue that runs and then having another playback that just stores the variable information for that effect so now i can have presets or subs or a separate queue stack that is just changing the variables that's coming out of another playback. And then like that opens up all sorts of other possibilities. It's not something that's current, like currently we can't record variable information in something that doesn't contain that effect. Um, and there's good practical reason for that. Um, and I think depending on where the feature goes, I could see myself go, I mean, I'm super excited about variables. I think it's something that could be ridiculously powerful if it can get unlocked to the full potential. But I also understand that it adds a level of complexity that a lot of people don't necessarily need. So I'm, I'm appreciative of that as well. Yeah, and I, you know, I also, this is why I encourage new features that, that folks play with it to see how it actually works with the workflow. Um, you know, EOS is, as a software base covers such a, a broad scope of, of markets. Um, you know, and, and not every feature is intended for, for every market or every use case. So use the tool that makes sense to you. Um, you know, if it adds unnecessary steps or unnecessary complications, um, maybe the way that you were doing it was fine, right? Just because it's new um, doesn't mean it's necessarily uh, uh, better. So play and, and see what, uh, what you're comfortable with. But I mean, outside of a music outside of a music context, like I absolutely use variables, you know, in the film and television world. So the amount of time where you know we're running an effect, and then on the fly we're asked to change something about that effect, um, you know, I can do that quickly at the ES. You know, that that gives me we we you know we've never really been great about the high low sort of effect, right? Um, we can you know you could go in and you could set it at the effect level. Uh, you could go in and you can use it. You could use it via, you know, maybe I'm using a high-low preset or a high-low palette, and I can control it that way. But this really gives me a way to, like, set, have true high-low effects um, or multiple steps, high, medium, low effects or whatever, um, and then change that on the fly. And I think it opens up a new dimension of the effects editor. So, like, in, like, film and television, which is related to busking, um, I definitely think it's a game changer for that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm interested to see how it'll, you know, sort of straight theater where we spend a lot of time in tech refining something and then we store it and then it plays back the same eight times a week, two matinees, right? Um, I'm interested to know how variables get applied in that production process because, well, I think it's useful to, to take your, your tools that have come from other show files. You're building something from the ground up for a very specific purpose. Um, or you know linear playback production, do variables actually get you anywhere? And I, I think people will play with that and, and make up their minds. So, um, sort of changing gears a little bit. Do you have any thoughts 
uh, Simon asks for, uh, about um, uh, with with linear effects in particular, um, changing the phase of something like a sine wave applied to uh, three parameters like RGB. You know, how would you how would you try and do that? Would that be require you doing three effects? Well, oh, you're saying like you want like you want like you want like offset phases? Is that kind of the question? I think so because the way that we currently deal with, I guess, if you run into that where you need to start stretching those things out from one another, would you automatically default to an absolute effect, or would you try and do three? Yeah, right. Three three effects seems seems hard. In, in short, I mean, right now, just to kind of review what current features are, if you put multiple parameters in an effect. Um, it's going to do the same thing to all of those parameters together, right? That's that's what that does, right? So what you get, yeah, David's going to run the example. I, uh, did I just? Oh, they're not. They're not out hand. It's in the black palette. Um, do, yeah, you can kind of see it, but it's yeah, it's running RGB all together. You can yeah. see it there in the in the table. Yeah. So this is where absolute effects. Do, do really well. And don't forget, you know, in your absolute effects, it was put in a while ago, but I think it's still underutilized. Um, there is a step time that was added to absolute effects, right? And and this is really a game changer because when you start talking about those phasings, um, that determines when the next step starts, similar to uh, step-based effects. So putting uh, a step time at zero allows multiple things to happen together. For example, if you're dealing with an intensity and with a color change, um, it also allows you to um, have a bit of, of space between the uh, the start of, of one step and, and sort of the, the start of the next. Um, so step time is really useful. I kind of call it like the effect go, right? So how long does does step two wait until we call step three? Um, just like we do in step-based effects, the, the you can make that positive or negative to the time and the dwell sum, and that will give you a little bit of uh, play in, in overlapping or or separating or phasing out uh, multiple steps. You know, I don't know. Anyway, yes, you can do it in here, and you would over, you could over basically you'd overlap you could overlap these step times. You know, I can make this you know 0.5, and then the next step, which would be green. Um, yeah, and you would over uh, finger. You no, know, and then when you overlap these, right, you would have, you know, you would have the zero and the hunt and the next overlapping uh, by half a second or whatever you want it to be. You'd get two. Anyway, I'm making making a bad example of it because I haven't had that much coffee, but you understand what I'm saying. Hopefully, it makes sense. Here. Yeah, it, it, it gives um it gives a lot of power to to absolute effects um in the way that only we can. effects had and I've been in there for a while. What did it go in? Like two point seven or something. So also play with that and uh and see how it works. Um yeah. a couple more questions coming in. Um uh before uh three point oh and variables, um Uh, I guess I'm I'm gonna sort of extrapolate this question, assuming that this that Owen is talking about um, uh, an express expression console. Um, did you ever find need uh, for more than just A B faders for different effects? Have you needed a set of C D in order to have different looks? So I think this talks about having um, uh, you know if you're applying uh, multiple effects to the same channel. Um, I can kind of touch on the rules of that, and maybe you can talk about how you get around it, David. Sure. Um, the rules are basically right now that we don't allow you to run more than one effect on any single parameter at a time. So, for example, if you're running an intensity effect and you apply uh, intensity, uh, another intensity effect, it's going to replace that intensity effect 
not compounded, right? So same with uh, color. If, if red, green, and blue are running a certain color chase, you apply another one. It's not going to compound it. It's going to replace it. Um, so that is the way the rules are. Though a single exception uh, is that you can run um, an intensity effect for multiple playback sources, and those will compound. And what do I mean by that? If I've got channels 1 through 10 running effect 1 on their density and it's stored in Q1, if I run another effect that's intensity um, on sub 1, then those will compound each other, right? So they can't be stored in the same location, um, but if they're stored in multiple locations, they will compound on top of one another. Um, so that is a, a current limitation of the system. That's, that's the way that exists. Um, David, what are what are things that you do to kind of help um, when you need to get, you know, I've got this thing running, but I also want to do this other thing. It depends on the fixture, right? Like here, for and these are these X bars are a great example because I can run one intensity effect on the cells and one on the master, so I can, in theory, run two effects on the same. David, do you want to pull your mic in a little bit? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, like these X-bars are a great example, right, because I can run one effect on the cells and one effect on the masters, and I'm effectively running two effects on the same parameter sets, but the desk views of them as, views them as different. Um, you know, I've done, like, you, you know, you can combine pixel maps with color effects and intensity effects to create some interesting looks. You know, I, you know, I did a, this parade where it was, all these color and intensity effects, and at the end they wanted to put a white shimmer over everything, which we already using the color effects parameters. So we took all the pixels, we shuffled them up, we deleted a bunch, we shuffled them up again, and then we ran some random content, white content over it, and we got kind of that white shimmer on top of a color effect. Um, there are ways to combine to combine um, to, to combine it. I mean. I think it's neat intellectually to do, like to run multiple effects on one parameter. There have been a handful of times when I've wanted to do it, but I've never felt hamstrung by the fact that I can't run more than one effect per parameter um, from the same playback. If for no other reason, then like, you know, most other desks can't do it either. So I think we've kind of evolved to do it in other ways. Um, I feel like I, you know, I, don't, I guess I don't understand like the CD portion of the question. CD fader portion of the question, but yeah, um, uh, you know this. I mean, we could we could have a whole session on console philosophy. Uh, we did with Sam Valentino. Um, it was great. It was, it was fabulous. Uh, yeah, but the other thing to remember is that the CD fader on on Express and Expression consoles existed uh, for uh, the sole purpose of allowing a preset style desk um, to act like a move fade desk in regards to overlapping looks, like effect, um, like a longer fade on top of a shorter fade. Um, if those words don't make sense to you, check out uh, in our study hall uh, Anne's discussion on move fade systems versus preset systems. Um, that's why the CD and AV faders is on express expression. And if there's interest in going deep into that, maybe at some point in the future we can do like a, a, a sub session on on the philosophy behind why those decisions were made, um, but uh, but yeah, because of the nature of EOS being a move fade desk, um, aside from effects, we don't need that CD fader to to let things run on top of one another. If that makes sense. Um, I think this is a a, a good question. Um, uh, just in practice, um, how are you finding? Um, uh, how are you calling out effects that you, you don't know their numbers, right? So, so you're trying to grab a group of channels that are running an effect. Um, you see the effect is running. What's your process of getting down to what effect is that so I can adjust it? You have um, particular macros. You have uh, you you know you use um, things like query. How do you how are you fast on that kind of stuff? This is a, this is an incredibly low tech answer. Like I just select the lights and then see what effects they're running. <laughs> I, I know there are other tools for it. I mean, I guess like I don't know if that's more of a like I've never you know I'll 
if I need to find out what lights are, you know, what effects are running on a light, I'll call up those lights and it'll tell me in the channel display what effects they are and then I know what effects that I need to modify. Um, that's about as complex as I get with it. I'm sure they were hoping for a more advanced <laughs> answer. Um, but, you know, it's like, I feel like a lot of those tools with like the querying for effects and all that, like a lot of that is, I don't know. I mean, Nick, I'd imagine you see more of that in like the theater world. I mean, I just, I don't do much like straight show theater stuff um, where I'm often going through like, I mean, very rarely am I like going through like a whole cue list to find specific channels that are running a particular effect. Like that's just not something I deal with all that often. So I don't have any like super amazing system for it. Yeah, and again, I think it's whatever you find is fastest, right? I know uh, Ziggy, who's a, a friend of ours who, who programs yeah. all over the world, she is a query maven, right? She, the way that she sets up her show files and her database in the back end allows her to use query um, uh, better than anyone I've seen. And, and so oh, yeah. it's just whatever, whatever tool you feel is fastest and gets you your net results. But I'm kind of the same way when I'm programming is like, I, I, the way my brain is wired is I pretty quickly associate channel numbers with chunks of the rig for the most part. It's, you know, like, so I can quickly see something in the rig and be like, oh, that's generally those channel numbers or using magic sheets to kind of grab that stuff more quickly. Um, if I see a channel doing something and I want to access it, I just type in the channel number. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like if we, I don't know what effect works with this, this effect. Great. Like, you know, we have a bunch of stuff in the ESD, like, it also comes down to channeling your rig. Like I look at, oh, I've got all this thing in the ESD. Well, I know the 500 series are the X bars. I know one through 10 are my park hands, and I know 101 through 110, like because it's the 100 series are the moving lights. So, like I think a lot of for me anyway, it also comes down to channel convention. Like channel your rigs in a way, and I know a lot of you coming from theater, you know, you're not the ones channeling the rigs. I'm the one channeling my own rigs, so that helps. But like channel the rig in a way that makes sense, so you could look at a pile of effects here and really quickly be like, oh, cool, like, five, you know, effect three is what's running on the X bars, because I can tell what what they are. Yeah, and I, I hope and suspect that things like labels in Augmented will also kind of help some of that stuff, right? The ability to, to turn on um, a label and, and not just see your rig over your desk, but see your rig in your console um, will help assess some of that stuff, too. Um, yeah, but if you have ideas of ways that you think that, that finding that stuff would be faster for you, um, we're always looking for that stuff and, and the forums and the place to post uh, new feature requests. So please do. Um, uh, Julius asked this uh, a long time ago. Sorry, we're just getting to this. Um, uh, but I know the answer to this, and I want your work around, David, which is, is basically no. that, um, um he asks about if you have the same effects stored in different queues, uh, different queue lists, um, and the queues are playing back at the same time. Is there a way to, to synchronize them? Um, I will also add to that, um, you know, different queues, uh, different effects, sorry, in different queue lists. Um, how are you dealing with trying to get multiple sources to feel like they're from the same thing? Uh, the short answer is the the tap and and BPM learn um, uh, doesn't work across multiple playbacks. I don't believe. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, how right. are you? How are you? When when the director is like, "Well, I need those things kind of chasing together." What's your thoughts? What's your what's your first go to? That's a great question. What's your answer, Nick? <laughs> <laughs> so, or is there... uh, I tend to do more, um, again, like linear playback production. So we generally have time to sit and speak. So I feel like my answer is I'm often given the latitude to sit and fuss. And that's what I do is I sit and fuss um, until everything feels like it's coming from the same point. The other thing that I've often found, oh. is, um, you know, if you're starting effects, uh, the board's going to keep playing them when you start them manually. Um, and if, if you want to resync them, rerunning the effects or like restarting the queue with the new effects added will actually show you what happens when they all start together. Um, yeah. So oftentimes I'll save an effect and do a queue 
even though I, I know that that's not the final effect, just so I can rerun that queue, right? Go to queue, enter is very really useful for just restarting that effect. Um, and uh, and that will at least show me where I'm at and how to how to get it going again and, and make tweaks from there. But I mean, I mean that's yeah okay. I mean that makes me feel better. I I, I thought there was some sort of fancy answer I was supposed to have. Um, no, you know, I like, like, like you know I, I you know I do a lot of like okay. <sighs> You try to be as elegant as you can about as many things as you can. Some things are just dirty. Um, and, you know, if, I'm, if I have multiple playback sources and they need to all sync up and they started at different times, like, you could, I mean, you could write a macro in a queue to trigger all that stuff at the same time. And then it'll all run together. You could, if you have the same effect on multiple things and it's running, you know, on multiple lights and it's running as two separate groups and you want it to run as one group, you know, like just select those lights and record that into another queue and then it'll dump it together and it'll redo the math. I mean, you know, I, I do a fair amount of uh, copy to and recall from in my world. Um, just because it's like, cool, like, you know, take all these things and put them together. And it's like, okay, great. And you store them together and maybe you put them just in a sub that you're going to use once. Or you put it in a queue, like you said, that you're going to use once just to have it there. Um, you know, there's no, like, resync all the global effects. Um, you know, recording an effect will restart all the effects. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, Nick, I think your answer and my answer are remarkably similar. I mean, I don't get the time to fa the fuss, but I'll, I'll shove it somewhere so that it all plays back at once, right? Or, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I'll definitely have macros, depending on the type of show that I'm doing, that will fire different lists or different submasters and stuff. And you could have macro, you know, I have macros that will add that to the execute columns of queues. So you can just have one queue. Oh, when I hit this queue, all this other stuff needs to go. Cool, you know. This queue executes, you know, execute macro this, this, and this, and this, and that'll fire all those subs or, you know, execute queue this, this, and this, and this, and all those queues will go at the same time. And at least it's like one go press. Um, yeah. I, I, don't I don't have anything. Yeah. And, have and anything now, that, now that we're in the, uh, the veritable after hours portion of, of this after dark, right? Um, we, uh, you know, I, I think this is a place where where he has a lot of room for improvement, right? Um, you know, being able to do more global synchronization, the software understanding um, more of what the left hand and the right hand are doing in regards to effects, and being able to bring um, synchronization to that stuff is definitely something that's been discussed uh, in internally, um, and uh, and you know the questions of what does that mean, and, and when can we fit it into development time? So um, I don't think any of us are, are saying that it, it's great the way it is and it's perfect. Um, so it's, it's something that uh, you know we hope to get to and, and hope to bring some real decent change to, you know, make it smart, make it intuitive, make it easy. Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, like the EOS FX editor, in my opinion, is remarkably powerful. It's definitely one, it's definitely the most powerful effects engine that I've used. Um, you know, are there places that it can improve? Like, of course, you know, but I think, you know, it's easy to get lost of how good, with how good we have it because we can't do every single little thing that we may not often need to do but sometimes need to do. You know, it's like, it, it's, and, you know, I get that way too. It's easy to lose, the, lose sight of the big picture of really how good we have it that we could do all these things really quickly. Um, in all these different ways, so yeah. And resyncing effects is say, one thing. Like, yeah, I'd like to see it be better, but they, you know, there's a handful of those things. But, but, sorry, last okay. bit on it, and then we'll move on. Like, one thing I have to say is that you know what I one thing that keeps me in love with this particular desk, not this particular desk, but this particular <laughs> desk. Um, is that you know you can go to the forums or reach out to you know not just Nick or whoever your local FPC is, but you know there are people who are watching the Facebook groups and ideally right the forums is where you're going with this stuff. But they like listen and they care and if it's a good idea they'll take it and they'll do something about it. Um, that's not the case with everything 
and every other manufacturer and just in life, right? Like, you know, I have an, you know, I have an Apple computer here and I don't like something about it. Sure. I can, you know, I can write to Apple. I don't think they're going to do anything about it, but like I can write the, you know, I can write something on a form about ETC and if it's a good idea, they'll take it and it'll make it in a future software version. And that level of power in the user's hand, I think is what has made this such a good desk and continues to push the platform forward is like the developers don't have all the good ideas. It's like a lot of the stuff that's made it in the desk is based on needs that users have had. And you see it come across and then later on you see it show up and you go, like, oh, hey, cool, like that's what we wanted, but that's actually better than what I was thinking because now someone else has looked at the idea. Um, and that's kind of the way I feel about it. Well, thank you. I appreciate the comments. Yeah, we, you know, there's no guarantee as to when it'll go into the software. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we certainly, I appreciate it. And, and you know, we, we love feedback. We love hearing how people are really using it because we can't predict everything. So. Um, we're almost 45 minutes over time, so I'm going to go ahead and just a couple of little questions in here that I just want to answer up um, before we sign off. Um, but I appreciate all of you who stuck with us till the better end. Uh, Patrick asks whether variables can be adjusted after they've been reported into a, a C7 macro. Absolutely, that's just going back into the effects editor um, and, and, excuse me, the effects status display um, and making a change uh, to that. Um, uh, I actually don't know the, I haven't played with this yet because it's, it's new, David, maybe you have. Uh, after you set your variables for um, an effect, uh, are you still able to change the cycle time with the wheel or just by placing a time? Um, I honestly haven't played with what result that has. On in, in the effect itself? Uh, I don't think it does anything in the effect itself. I think, I think you mean like the ESD? Yeah, the ESD, like an override. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't see why you wouldn't, because it, cause at that point it has a time, right? So, uh, yeah, no, okay. so like, which, uh, keep forgetting that I, uh, I'm also running all the media server off the console, so I can't just go to queue up. Um, and which effect was it the hell the timing goes? Fourteen, fifteen. 14, 14, 14, 14, 14. Uh, well, I'm going to get that set up. Yeah. If, okay, I'll answer yeah. a quick question. Uh, Andrew, a long time ago, sorry, uh, asked. Uh, how do you run an RGB EOS pre-built effect on an RGBW unit without having the white washout saturation? Um, so what's happening there, Andrew, is that the only the RGB parameters are being called in that RGB effect. So the white stays at its home value. Um, you need to turn off that W uh, parameter in order for the RGB to just do its full saturation rainbow. Um, uh, the RGB effect does not affect uh, the W, um, and if you're looking for it to do that, my recommendation and what I prefer to do because I have more control over it is to build a couple of color palettes and build an absolute effect. Um, it's super fast. It's way easy. Uh, the first thing I like to do is go into my standard colors and my color picker, grab my whole rig and just bang in those colors in the color palette so I have them, um, and, and then throw those into a, a, an absolute effect. Um, and that will ensure that all the parameters get sent to the color that you want them to go to. Don't, you know, I don't work for ETC, so I guess I'm allowed to say this. Don't, don't use these pre-built color effects. Like, <laughs> just yeah. don't. It's, you know, uh, there's a lot of great stuff in here. These, this one, and this one, and this, like, it was a, they break, I mean, they break the rules of, of like, you can't build them. They're magic boxes. Um, not that one, but you know, they're just don't use them. Just make like Nick was saying, do a color palette chase. Do you know you you can hard code values. You know, I have I have effects that'll just run red chases regardless of what the color parameter are because it brings all the other color parameters to zero. Like there are enough other easy ways to write these effects um, that give you control because ultimately you get into you know this. And it's great, but then you want to change something about it, and you're kind of stuck. Like, it's kind of what it does. Um, whereas, like, it took me two seconds to build this chasing rainbow effect that we have on these, these X bars here. Um, so as someone who does not work for ETC, just, you're going to spend more time trying to get the, pre, in my opinion, trying to get the pre-built color effects to work than you, at that time, you could have built your own effect. Working Sorry, for ETC, yes. I will say that you will spend more time trying to get the <laughs> effects to work than you will if you build your own. 
you know, <laughs> and, and yeah, that's, that's where it is. So, um, Matt also mentioned on this similarly, you know, like, uh, using something like a source four LED, trying to get something like nine seventeen to work on all seven colors. Again, the, the effect doesn't do it. Uh, use, use your absolute effects. Um, it will be faster than trying to wrestle that 917 effect into submission. So, um, sorry, we were on another thing that you were going to go over, David. Oh, 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 I just wanted to show, I mean, I thought it would work, and it does work, which is great. Look, great wheel on a variable effect. Woo, it works. Great. There you go. So, there you go. It's a thing. It works. Very good. Well, now we know. The more you know. Yeah. Because rate is right. Because rate is a percentage of cycle time, and you're defining the cycle time by the variables in the ESD. So I mean, yeah, stands to reason. And I'm assuming uh, Simon has also asked about how that affects global effects time, um, like on a global effects fader and things like that. Um, I'm assuming it's much the same way that it, it, it's just taking that overall time um, and multiplying it by whatever you set the, the timing fader to. 110 percent, 90 percent, whatever. So it's going to take the variables that you've added and, and squish or or expand them um, appropriately. Um, Osman, hey, how are you? Uh, is asking if you have um, some thoughts about working with augmented um, and and doing some kind of busking stuff uh, without a fader wing. You know, I, I know you tend to work on big big shows with big desks. Um, do you ever work like on a nomad setup and, and you have thoughts about um, what do you do on a single screen if, you, if you've got a bus? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, busking, right? It's all about, not going to sound familiar to a lot of people, right? It's all about real estate management. It's all about making the most out of whatever surfaces that you have, right? So like, I mean, it's cool. Like even this fader page module here, right? We have the options to add more rows and columns. We can turn the sliders off. We can, you know, we can do stuff here to make it more conducive to us busking. Um, again, I am more of a playback style busker. You can certainly manually value busk without, you know, without any faders, right? Cause you're just throwing manual values around and macros to deal with all that stuff. Um, that, I don't like that for my OCD. It makes me a little crazy. Um, you know, when I busk those shows, like when I'm busking shows, I, I just make sure I have the hardware I need. Like I know it's not a practical answer. Um, you know, you can, I mean, you could certainly have macros that will run, you know, because you don't need the faders to put cue lists on the faders. So there's no reason you can write a macro that would run that fader or a macro that would bump that button or a macro that would do something else and then has, you know, anything I need to press and hold, I can press here and hold. Um, that's, um, but, you know, for, for bump buttons, these buttons are great. For running cues, you can use macros. The scene thing that we showed in the videos is really good for that, great, right? because you're running, you're running scenes. Um, that are not out of faders that you're not touching. But I mean, I, I think if you want to, I think if you want to busk at any sort of high level, you need some sort of hardware. I just, I mean, I don't, I don't know, Nick, if you have an opinion on that. Like, I, I can't imagine busking without at least some faders. I've done it on 10 faders and 20 faders, you know, but you know, busking on an at five would be really difficult with only five faders. Um, you could do it, but. Yeah. I also, I tend to be, I'm more okay with manual busking in, in the way that I have, have come up. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the things to consider is if you have the time to set up your show file. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about this. I don't even remember what session I was in. Rob might remember. But a um, hundred years ago when we started these, uh, I remember talking about, um, you know, being really task specific with your screens. Um, and I think that it's more important the fewer screens and the fewer surfaces you have. So, you know, if you're doing something like playing with color on a um, on a, a pixel wall that's changing, maybe you have a snapshot that loads you into just those tools. 
so you can really quickly have access to those groups and those color palettes and those macros and whatever you've built for that thing. And then you can pop back out to a bit of a global view. And if you need to, you know, dive into um, moving effects, you know, stuff that, you know, you're getting your, your moving lights roving around or doing, doing can-cans or things like that. Um, it, it may be, instead of trying to cram everything in one work surface um, and, and have everything be small or, or not quite fit, um, perhaps having a couple things be stationary, like an augmented window and a navigation pane and some basic clustering tools, and then have the other half of your screen be paintable and changeable with different tool sets. So um, it's, it's another way to consider it. Um, and, get, and get really comfortable with the snapshot tools, right? Like, I mean, it's crazy how specific we can get with what frames and then what tabs and what frames. And like, I love them nothing more than like a single frame snapshot that only has one tab. Like, and then I'll use another frame to just change that. And you can make stuff be contextual. Like, you can get really like, the yeah. The less real estate you have, the more valuable that real estate becomes. And then learning how to manage it via this window uh, becomes really important. Yeah. Um, a couple more things. I'm going to try and take us not into the fourth hour. Um, so thanks for those of you who are hanging on. Um, uh, Stephen asked if you can touch really quickly on um, random group at the effect level uh, versus like mm -hmm. an offset random. Um, yes. I think okay. that's a good, a good clarification to make. Yeah. So. Random group, okay, so the stuff at the effect level, let's go ahead and let's make an effect here. Um, random group, right, we'll do this, where's our full white? Okay, so random group will take random, it's gonna randomize the channel selection, but it's also gonna take random groups of those channels and then apply random actions to those. So it's like doing like a quadruple random. And sometimes it's great, and like sometimes it's not so great. Um, great for like flicker effects, right? But if I'm doing like a random strobe, um, let me go ahead and I'll just grab these X bars and I'll apply that new effect to it. And then let's go ahead and come in here and let me give you both screens. Um, and I'm going to apply random group, right? Like here, like in this two step, it's kind of like, it's not so great. Like it's taking random groupings of cells and it's randomly jumping around. Um, one place we can make this a little better is by adding more steps. That's one thing I do a lot. And, I'll, and then I'll make this, maybe I'll make this other one a white. Um, and you can kind of start to deal with it that way and you can manage grouping. Um, but bear in mind, this is doing random channels and random actions. So just this by itself, isn't really a great way to randomize channel selection because it's not, not really doing it in the same way. Um, so I always, you know, if I'm doing a strobe effect or something like that, I'm always going to use my offset random as my starting point, right? So I'm always going to use that first, like already that looks better um, because it's just, for whatever reason, the random that it does at the channel level is better. Um, and now it's also running through the table linearly. So I have more control that way. Um, and then from here, I can pile on random group on top of that and, Again, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not. In this case, it doesn't seem, it really seem to be helping me. Um, so if you're doing like, my kind of rule of thumb is like flicker effects and fire effects and stuff, I'll use random group because um, it's not as particular and finicky, but anything where I'm doing like a random strobe, I'm going to be using, um, I'm just, I'm just going to be using the random at the channel level. Um, yeah, because they're, di they're different tools, you know, they're doing different things. I think it's understand it's important to understand that it's like one reason why random works really well for Flickr, right, is, uh, and I know we're best for time, but like in effect 16, right, if I make a linear effect here and I choose like one of these forms, right, I'm going to be jumping to different places in this waveform with random group. So that's a whole, that's a lot of different places I can go as opposed to just the four actions in my absolute effect. So for like waveform effects, it sometimes makes sense to have random group because there's more places for it to go. Yeah. I think well put. That's all I got to say about that. Woot. Um, so we'll wrap it up. There's a couple of, of things. Oh, and was clarifying about the A, B, C, D. Um, 
I might have to email Owen. I'm still not really understanding what you're asking. Uh, maybe this makes sense to you, David. Um, uh, or it's all good? OK, cool. Uh, email me when you can if you still have questions. Thanks, Owen. Um, and then finally, there's a, a quick question about um, manipulating the way that, that VMS renders a color um, uh, if, if it doesn't the red doesn't fit with your expectations, can you change it? Um, so if that's in your pixel map preview, um, no, we're, we're going to render the RGB um, locally, you know, so um, we're, we're not, there, there's no override to how that displays. Um, so if the red that you have on stage um, is looking different than the red that's showing up on your monitor, um, we don't really give you any correction tools. There's a lot of reasons for that. If you haven't watched the thing we did on the color system, um, I explain a lot about why there are discrepancies sometimes between what's on stage, what's in your color system, and what's on your monitor, um, and, uh, and and away we go. So, um, so cool. Uh, cool. Well, thank you, everybody, for, for hanging in there. Um, David, thank you so much. This was, as always, enlightening. Um, again, if you all have further questions, feel free to reach out uh, to me via email. Uh, David's going to make this show file available with this recording, so some of the stuff that's in there. Again, he, he started from a, a blank show file, um, so really nothing that can't be done, um, but he's going to include some stuff for you to play with uh, when we release this in a, in a few weeks. So thanks, everybody. Uh, stay well, and uh, we will see you on the next one. Bye, guys. Bye.